We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. So, uh, yeah, a number of things on a recording day today. Uh, it is uh, Amazon Prime Day. And uh, not a ton of deals in Canada, but uh, that was one thing. And then it was, uh, let's see, Apple iPhone 12 event day. And uh, let's see, interesting news there is that you can record on the iPhone 12s in Dolby Vision now, the regular iPhone 12, up to 30 frames per second in Dolby Vision, and on the iPhone 12 Pro, up to 60 frames per second in Dolby Vision. Uh, and then the only other home theater related thing was the, uh, the HomePod Mini. A little $99 HomePod mini that, uh, boy, that sure looks like one of the new Amazon Echo devices. And uh, the price is not egregiously more expensive. And I kind of think some OEM out there uh, decided and figured out how to make spherical speakers and uh, got got both companies on board. That's my theory. Uh, <laughs> Bang it all since making all the speakers. Right. Uh, I just figured out that this glass that I put water in for me, to, it's a solo cup because yes. we have no cups in our house right now. <laughs> um, there is something, many somethings at the bottom of this cup. Oh. So I will be taking a break shortly to go get okay. myself a fresh, clean glass of water. Even but before that, with your shelf liners, that happened. <laughs> no, that happened because some child left that cu that cup out and didn't tell me that they had used it and not cleaned it. So Because uh -huh. we're uh -huh. reusing solo cups because we're not... <laughs> animals trying to destroy the planet one solo cup at a time ah yes but uh yes uh, this is av rant the podcast that answers your home theater and av questions get your questions answered all you have to do is ask yes by emailing us at question at avrant.com you go to avrant.com leave us a comment there facebook.com slash av rant podcast youtube.com slash av rant contact us directly rob at avrant.com his twitter is at first reflect i'm tom at avrant.com my twitter is at avrant underscore tom mm-hmm Yes, uh, we were back in the house. Okay. Uh, I found out that when I was making the joke that if you want a gray shelf liner in the city, in the, in the greater St. <laughs> Petersburg area or Tampa Bay area, you were out of luck. And oh boy, was I right. Ah, yes. Because I, I used everything I had and I needed two additional rolls. And I have been looking for them for over a week now. Mm. <laughs> and they're not coming back. And I went to Amazon. I thought, okay, well, I'll just order it from Amazon. Mm -hmm. I went to Amazon. They had one six pack of that of that style and color left, mm -hmm. and that's it. They s don't sell individual ones. They don't sell. Mm. And you only two need packs. two. I need. I mean, I was going to get three just in case, sure. but now I'm going to get six. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> Walmart? Does Walmart have them? Nope. All right. <laughs> no, everybody's out of stock. I don't think that company's <laughs> making that color anymore. So, <laughs> whatever. I guess. Like Tom is coming. It is. Quick. It's just like me to do that too. It's just <laughs> now you may notice that my voice sounds different, deeper, sexier. Mm. Who knows what your what your wife thinks about my voice? But uh, ask her; she'll probably lie. But uh, yeah, I'm back on the old mic. I did not feel the desire, need, or motivation to set up the camera, so I'm not on video this week. But it's okay. Small victories. I will commit to next week okay. to being on camera. I will commit to that. <laughs> Little bits it's been of a time. kind of a day. Mm. Yeah been kind of a day so you know little things like you know they the the cabinet guy's almost done and uh the other guys took and installed the refrigerator and i said well when are you gonna push it all the way back they're like it is all the way back i'm like mm -hmm. but it's like protruding 10 inches 10 inches pr you know proud <laughs> of it you know it's supposed to be like six inches deeper because it was supposed ah. to stick out a little bit but it was supposed to be six inches deeper he goes yeah we thought those cabinets looked a little thin too but <laughs> We didn't want to say anything. I'm like, <laughs> we we decided to finish it all and make it. Well, no, that, that was the cabinet guy. The cabinet guy's not there. This is the other guys. Uh -huh. These are the other guys that are working on the rest of the room, not the cabinet guys. And I'm like, so I took a picture of it and I sent it to him. I'm like, this is an issue. Mm. This is not. This is not what we agreed to. Mm. This is not what the pictures, you you know, what we discussed look like. And now we have an issue. So ah oh, dear. Um, I expect a long. 
time of radio silence as people <laughs> point fingers at each other and I just sit here waiting to see who I'm going to yell at next. On top of that, I got an email from my credit card company said, did you leave a 100% tip? Oh. It wasn't. It was like 90-something. 100% tip uh, at this for lunch. I was like, no. It was hmm. like 10 bucks. It was you know, it was a $40, $43, and they, it had a $40 mm-hmm. tip on it. I'm like, I said, well, if, if you didn't, then you should call the restaurant and get it figured out. So I called the restaurant, and they were like, well, we have it right here. It has your signature on it. And I was uh-huh. like, well, you know, I didn't I didn't do this, so there, there, it must be some mistake. So they sent it. They, they scanned in and sent it to me. I'm like, well... The signature on here looks like J. Well, uh-huh, and uh-huh. since the, my name is Tom Andre, and there is no J, no W, no E, and no L in <laughs> any part of my name, yeah, yeah. this is not my signature, and I did not sign that, and I did not write those those numbers on there. And not only that, I'm like the world's laziest tipper. <laughs> like I am the world's laziest tipper. I like so if your bill is, you know, whatever the bill is, I like take the number you know figure out what 20 percent is approximately mm-hmm. you know so it's a, it say it's a hundred dollar bill i'm like i know 20 bucks is sure is it right so so it's a 98 dollar bill i'm going to tip you 20 dollars because it's that's close enough to 100 and then i don't want to do the math for the cents right. or anything so i just make it even yeah. so if it was a 98 dollar bill i would probably give you like 119 dollars okay because i don't want to have to figure it out yeah and i don't write the tip on there i just write the total and sign it. I'm like, you could do the math. That's what I'm paying you for. You could serve me food and do the math. So none of this was right. Like none of it was right. Mm. So the restaurant contacted me back like right before their dinner rush. So I haven't heard back from them, but I responded back. I was like, dude, that ain't my signature. So hopefully it won't be a problem, but um, you know, hopefully they'll just, you know, figure it out, but one way or the other, but um, it's either that or I'm just going to call a credit card company and say, uh, just right, this yeah, charge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now they get nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so you can either give me back the 30 bucks <laughs> or uh, you get nothing. Because I probably would have tipped uh, nine. I would have rounded it up to nine or 10. So I was like, you know, just make it 10. You guys just, just give her 10 mm-hmm. and give me back my 30 and everybody's, everybody's fine. Well, over on my so, side, uh, this past Monday was uh, Thanksgiving. Because I'm in Canada, and we celebrate Thanksgiving in October. Oh, that's right. I forgot you guys are going to eat. Oh, I almost drank from that water again. Uh huh. <laughs> that's what we do. So, uh, so uh, wasn't able to get together with anybody on the actual Monday, but uh, on the weekend, because oh. I usually try to see my parents in some way, uh, often virtually. But uh, we're like, is anything? It was supposed to rain all weekend. Luckily, Saturday evening, it was actually really quite nice. So uh, we did Thanksgiving out on a balcony. So that we could nice. uh, be distanced. Uh, still had a turkey because my my dad was not about to not have a turkey on Thanksgiving. So I uh, still got whether it was just going to be like my mom, my dad, and me. There still would have been a turkey. But thankfully, my sister and her family able to come over, have it out on the balcony. Wasn't even that cold. Light jackets was all we needed. So uh, lucked out a bit there, and that was nice to be able to have some kind of celebration with the family. And uh, there you go. Happy Thanksgiving, Canadians. That's good. You know, I didn't test to see if my audio is working. Oh. Is my audio wor- it is working? Right? I mean, I'm hearing you, so we got that back up. Well, that's good. I mean, it could be going through the speakers of the, I mean, the microphone on the right. thing, but it doesn't look like it. All right. So uh, let's uh, thank our listeners of the week. Mm-hmm. So to become a listener of the week, you just have to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which sends you to a PayPal donation site. So we want to thank Theo and Alan. Is that, are those the right names? I mean, that's what I heard. I'd, oh I'm not sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it again. There, there's multiple Theo things that could have gone wrong. If, <laughs> that is not your name. I apologize in advance because I really feel like it is your name, <laughs> Alan and Theo. Yes, those are the right oh, names. Those are great. I okay. thought for sure. Well, I go. thought for sure I had it. Wrong. I, I easily sorry, questioned guys. what I had heard, and then there's also what you said versus what you read versus who it actually was. But you know what? They're all it one. Could have the been same. so many things. I could have screwed it up in so many ways. But this one. I mean, I today was I I I went and I, I said to myself, you know what? We've got these crappy blinds in the front of our house. We're just, I'm just gonna go to Home Depot and get us just get. I'm not gonna get real super high end. I'm just gonna get some blinds. Sure. So they, they install them, they reinstall them. I'll have nice blinds. So I went and measured the window, and then I went and measured it again, and I went and measured it again, and every single time, 103 and a half. Okay. That's how many inches it was. 103 and a half. So I called my wife as I was going there. I said, listen, honey, you know, I measured at the bottom. And the top should be the same, <laughs> but maybe it's not. Right. So would you measure it? And she said, yeah. So she 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 
texted me and she goes, it's 105 and a quarter. I'm like, Ooh. are you sure? <laughs> you sure? So I called her up. I was like, are difference? you sure? I mean, that's not even close. She goes, I, yeah, I, I measured it twice. I'm like, okay, I, I believe you, <laughs> but are you sure? She goes, yeah, I measured the bottom two. The bottom is also 105 and a quarter. Oh, okay. I'm like, now we have questions. Are you sure? Are you sure? She goes, uh, not only that, but the one of the contractors is here, and he measured it, and he agrees with me. I'm like, that's that sounds like me. That sounds exactly like me. So if I had gotten Theo and Alan's names wrong, uh, I would not have been shocked. We also want to thank our 123 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you can sign up to be a continuing or an ongoing subscriber, a supporter of our podcast by giving a monthly donation that they they take from your bank account and give to us for as long as you allow them to do that. So $1 minimum, infinity dollars maximum. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank our 123 patrons over at patreon.com. That is right. Well, I will say, Theo, Alan, thank you very much for the PayPal donations. And to our 123 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast. for anybody else who might like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, thank you very much for the financial support. It is very much appreciated. And if you can't support us financially, we completely understand. So if you can do something or have done something that supports us, you just have to let us know what it is, and we will shout you out. So we want to thank Ken. Ken received his nine HTM 200 SC speakers from Ascend and told them it was our recommendation. DJ from the Bright Side Home Theater podcast, who apparently just just trying to get on here as much as he can, doing all this free publicity. <laughs> Dude, where's my money? <laughs> Anyways, DJ had a blackout. Uh, which is, you know, dude, this is an AA meeting type of conversation. We don't need to hear about this on AV Radio. Mm. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. His APC battery units kept most of his gear up and running, but his SVS subs were plugged into other outlets. Their amplifiers were kaput. But SVS took care of him, and DJ tweeted about all of it with our handles included, so APC and SVS would know we recommended them. Uh, notes of we got some notes. We also got some notes of gratitude from Terry, Jeremy, and Lango, who was happy with our RSL Speedwoofer 10S recommendation. He says it'll be perfect for his office. Uh, for Theo, Nathan, who shared an article about Three Below Theater in San Jose doing their best to find a way to reopen on their roof. Yep. And Bertrand. Bertrand. <laughs> I mean, I figure if you've got a movie theater, you've got a wall big enough to project upon. So, you know, at least you can have four or two or whatever you know screens outside uh, that you could be showing something i mean it'd be, have to be the same movie for both of them they're doing but. it now you know in october which i mean san jose i'm sure it, it is still it is hot. perfectly fine to be able to wouldn't want to be doing oh, it here no. in vancouver <laughs> no i wouldn't be so working it's in finally november. probably getting cool enough so that you can sit outside like without san air jose. conditioning <laughs> Yeah, without without air conditioning, it, it's it's it'll be nice the, now. The projector the, doesn't catch on fire, <laughs> <laughs> right? So yes, thank you to all of you people. Yes, I'll say the names again. Ken, uh, congrats on receiving your nine HTM two hundred SEs from Ascend. Thank you very much for talking us up to them. Uh, DJ, yeah, he shared that whole uh, odyssey of his on uh, Twitter as well as on his own podcast. So, uh, yeah, he was like, "Oh man, these APCs were really handy, but not all was well." So, <laughs> thankfully, right. SVS came through, which is always fantastic to hear. Uh, glad that we I'm got mentions. That yeah, that, that it wasn't just a fuse or something that he could have replaced. Yeah, I'm surprised I was thinking that. it probably just was the fuse, but regardless. But maybe they just they would rather just yeah. have it back and <laughs> it, it, hot swap it out than they could put it in a re. You know, they're like, okay, well, we put a fuse in this thing and test it to make mm -hmm. sure it was all right. Let's put it in a brand new one that will sell at V stock. Yep. Yeah, so so it all worth it, it all worked out, and then uh, Terry, Jeremy, Ilongo, Theo, Nathan, and Bertrand really do appreciate the notes of gratitude and encouragement that were sent in to us. Uh, definitely is appreciated at this time, and uh, yeah, we we like that a lot. So thank you for all the support, and thank you to everyone who continues to listen and send in your questions. It's uh, it's right. really nice. It's it's really quite easy to get mentioned on this podcast. Yep. <laughs> Just ask DJ once he figured out figured out the system. <laughs> He's like taking it to the bank. <laughs> like, uh, why would anybody pay for advertising when all you gotta do is you know call up, say thanks for keep going. This is APC. Oh, dang it! <laughs> gotta, <laughs> could you just say this this episode was brought to you by? <laughs> sure, fine, whatever. I just bought another APC unit mm -hmm. too. So I mean, that's how much I like them. <laughs> All right, in the news, Sony released a teardown video of the PS5 last week showing the larger side, slightly complicated stand, removable side panels, and the location of the SSD expansion bay. 
uh, the massive heat sink, and the liquid metal thermal interface material. Uh, they also announced that the firmware update to add all of the HDMI 2.1 features for their ready for PlayStation 5 TVs, including the X900H, is expected to arrive between winter 2020 and spring 2021, which in COVID terms is Emotiva sent it to you, <laughs> which will be sometime after the PS5's uh, November 12th uh, launch date, no matter how you cut it. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, a little bit unexpected that uh, that X900H might not be getting uh, all of the uh, HDMI 2.1 features. That's including like your 4K 120 variable refresh rate support uh, that we were very much looking forward to with these new systems. So a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit unfortunate. They're saying that won't arrive until at the earliest winter 2020 and uh, November 12th. By however, whether you call that financial years or or you know meteorological years whatever it is uh november 12th is before winter so uh yeah seems like that won't be coming for a little bit but uh yeah there was the whole tear down last week of the uh, playstation 5 it is a it is a physically large can system it, can it be it, it can it doesn't have to stand up like that right? it does not I have mean, to stand up sh- it can go horizontal standing up yeah no okay. it can it can go That's... horizontal and uh yeah huge heat sinks uh expansion bay for your own ssd uh western digital claims to have the first uh, SSD that is uh, compatible with it. Uh, it costs two hundred thirty dollars for the one terabyte Western Digital uh, NVMe SSD. So that's ten dollars more than the proprietary SSD that plugs into the Xbox Series X. Uh, but over time, hopefully, prices on those will come right. down. All right. All right. Marantz released their newest pre-pro. It's the AV seven seven zero six. It's the, basically the, it's not basically it is the SR seventy fifteen receiver, but with XLR outputs, no amps, and it costs twenty five hundred dollars instead of twenty three hundred dollars, and it tops out at eleven speakers. Mm. So. so this is not uh, the on, flagship because it doesn't do the no. thirteen speakers like the right. uh, SR eighty fifteen receiver does. I'm assuming at some point there will be a new flagship level pre pro. I'm imagining it'll come along with Denon's flagship receiver to pr- replace the X eighty five hundred and the A one ten variant of it. Uh, uh, I'm hoping, predicting, let's say predicting that they'll actually go up to 15 speaker support with the next iteration. So they're at 13 right mm-hmm. now, but now there's a Denon X6700H that can do 13 speakers. So you got to go above that. You got to go more with the new flagship. So I'm hoping for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, the fact that it's only $200 more, which I know it's mm-hmm. ridiculous to even say that you can take out all those amps and then still <laughs> charge more, but this is how these things work it is. and that's actually not that they bad. sell fewer <laughs> of them so that's that's right economies of scale coming into play there's still just one hdmi 2.1 input no, nothing has changed yeah. on that front i would highly recommend you don't buy it i'm sorry <laughs> i love marantz i would not this very few people i would recommend there's actually of the people who would buy a pre-pro like this I would. They were probably all fine because all of them are like, "Well, just have a phono input." Mm. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Whatever, dude. Yes, know what they're getting get into. <laughs> you're not going to be plugging in your X, your Xbox, whatever, whatever. All right. Pixar Soul S O U L was the last major Disney title that hadn't been given a new theatrical release date yet. It's going to be on Disney Plus instead now on Christmas Day. No premiere access for this one, so I know what I'm doing Christmas Day. Sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, honestly, people who've seen some preview of it have said it looks like it's a really good one. Uh, looks like it's going to be one of those one of those what really top class Pixar one top class that was, Pixar. wasn't very good. I know. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, some of the directed video stuff. Cars 2. Uh, Cars 2, <laughs> for sure. I didn't like much of the... I mean, I didn't... I liked... I know everybody loves Toy Story, okay? The mm-hmm. first Toy Story is great. Fine. I like the first Toy Story. The rest of them, I'm like, blah. Toy Story 2 was great. Blah. You didn't like Toy Story 2? Eh. I love Toy Story 2. <laughs> I couldn't be more meh about those movies oh, okay. if I tried. Like I, So we went through, and we have a bookshelf that is right on the other side of my home theater. And uh, it was chocker block full of books and movies. I mean, you could not fit anything else up there. Okay. So when we painted the shelves, I purposely did not paint two or three of them, I don't remember. Because I wanted to have two, bigger, uh, two or three bigger open bays that we could use to you know display things okay uh specifically my wife has some turkish copper because she is 
Turkish. And uh, it, it, it's always been, it's been kind of tucked away and, you know, not really on display. And I kind of wanted to display this stuff. So I did that. And, I, and as we were, getting, we were going through our books and movies and stuff, like that, I'm, we're like, listen, I'm like, listen, if we're not watching this stuff. If you're not excited about watch, seeing it again, if you're not like, oh, my God, I need to see this movie. We're getting rid of it. We're getting, all of it's going. We're going. So, uh, yeah, Toy Stories did not make the cut. <laughs> they were gone. That's where we're going with this. <laughs> That's that Toy Story Blu-ray did not make the cut. Mission even Impossible Two. Did you throw out Mission Impossible Two? I don't own it, but if I did, <laughs> the fact that there's rock climbing at the beginning of it oh, might have right. been its only right. saving grace. Even though it's the most ridiculous <laughs> rock climbing, this 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 far uh... west of anything ever done in Bollywood. <laughs> So, all right. Uh, prices for Netflix in Canada have been raised. You can technically still pay as little as ten dollars a month, but it only gets you an SD resolution and one screen. It's fifteen dollars a month now for the standard plan, which is HD resolution, two screens. But the only way to get four K HDR and Atmos is with the four screen plans that now cost a whopping nineteen dollars a month. Yeah, and that is too much for me. Uh, I will be tapping out on that. Uh, now I'm yeah. hoping that because um, to me Netflix is worth fifteen dollars a month. In my mind, that's what it is. Now, when they were like, okay, it's going to be a dollar more to get 4K and HDR and Atmos, I was like, all right, all right, I'll do it because I want the 4K and the Dolby Vision and the Dolby Atmos. Okay. And then when it was $2 more, when it was $17 a month, I was like, okay, okay. But now they're going up another two to $19. I'm like, no, that's $20 a month. That is more than Netflix is worth to me. Now, obviously, I'm How saying- How much do I pay? <laughs> I'm like, well, keep in mind, this Canadian dollars, so, you know, know version, but I'm but, like, $15 a month, okay, I could stick with the HD resolution, but I'm like, no, no, I care about HDR, and I care about Atmos, and uh, and, and this is not okay, so uh, I've tweeted at Netflix Canada, I, I got on a live chat, I sent them an email, I, 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 I want people to voice, because I think, th I think there's no reason why they can't add a fourth tier that goes in between $15 a month and $19 a month. Uh, you know, I was already paying $17 a month, so so let's add a tier that it's at $17 a month, still gets you 4K, HDR, and Atmos, but not four screens. Why? Do, well, I don't need four screens. I could, I'm fine with one screen, to be perfectly honest. So let's reduce the number of screens and, and keep some kind of $17 a month thing. That's That's my crusade for however many Canadians are subscribed to Netflix on the highest tier and want to join me in doing that. Uh, yeah, there you go. Mm. <laughs> what are you paying, $13? Something like that? I can't, I, I'm trying to figure it out. I, I have the Ultra plan, yeah. but I don't know what it is. So is that $13? I don't know. I don't know the American price. I, I just remember that my wife told me I had to change the credit card. Ah, yeah. on this. Uh, Netflix... <laughs> Netflix prices Premium USA. Premium <laughs> Ultra HD price. <laughs> it should come up. Google 16. 16? 16. It's 16 dollars American? I mean, I mean I think that's what the I think that's what it is. That was September 20, 2020. They they that was the streaming uh, plans. Wow. So that's H that's H D plus Ultra H D. Yeah. But I can get H D for thirteen dollars. Okay, that's the thirteen dollar so. one. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, it sounds like oh. we have the, it's the same pricing. Though. Well, yeah, I mean, $17 Canadian versus $16 American. That's actually not a bad exchange. Uh, the, this is probably closer to what that is. But still, I mean, you know, most of us with the 4K and Dolby Vision and Atmos plan, like, we, we don't need four screens, you know? Why yeah. does it have to be everything just to get 4K and Atmos? Sounds like when we used to complain about uh, a la, wanting a la carte. Yep stuff and now we get all the cart stuff and we complain about how much everything costs oh i always said that was going to be the case <laughs> yeah all right let's get into the questions here unless whatever no okay joe joe has a jvc nx5 projector and an oppo 203 ultra hd blu-ray player when he first got it the nx5 did not have frame by frame tone mapping so we actually settled on using the oppo's hdr to sdr conversion as over Overall, that seemed to produce the best image, but after last year's firmware update, the JVC can do frame by frame tone mapping, and they're supposed to be releasing the even better version via another firmware update in November. So, should he let his JVC do the tone mapping now, or stick with what already looks good with his Oppo doing HDR to SDR conversion? And if, before you answer this question, mm -hmm. Rob, since I clearly do not know, <laughs> um, and even if I had done any research beforehand, would have just looked at this question and went, this is a Rob question. All right. I don't really care. Yeah. But before you answer this question, how long is it going to take you? To 
to do what? Answer the answer the question. Oh, I, need to get, I want to get a glass of water. Uh, and I want to know this, if I can, this, if I got time. This one isn't the one. This one is a super short answer because okay, that's what I thought. All right, go go. The go, answer go. is yes. You should let the JVC do its frame by frame. That's tone what mapping. I was That's say, I mean, there's not really much what... more to expand upon it than that. That that's what you should do at this point. It does a really excellent job of it, and you won't have the weird thing where some movies end up looking a little bit dimmer because they only had the fixed metadata before. It's like no, it just it, it forgets about the metadata and goes okay. Okay, I'm just going to analyze, analyze it frame by frame and make it look as good as it can. So that's what you should do now. Okay. All right. Mike. Mike saw the price and specs in an early review of the new Samsung The Premier LSP 9T Ultra Short Throw Projector. I don't understand why all these things from Samsung now sound like they're a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> WWE wrestler like the wall oh, versus the, the premiere the terrace the serum the terrace they're gonna fight on the terrace in the, the frame <laughs> Imagine. and you better not leave out the 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 oh, has right. to be Again, there. the the he's he's the boss of all of them that's right Okay, since he was considering a JVC NX7, the price is still very, very competitive. The early reviews are very positive for the 9T, and the specs for light output and dynamic contrast are higher than the NX7. So, is the Samsung 9T actually better than the NX7? Or, if you have the correct screen and optimum, uh, optimal sorry, uh, ambient light conditions, will a traditional long throw projector like the NX7 still look better? And if so, why? I'm going to tell you what I would do before I go get my glass mm -hmm. of water here. And that is, I don't want to see the projector in front of me. Oh, right. <laughs> have to deal with that, you know, no matter what. So I think I would rather have the projector behind me. Uh, unless there is absolutely zero light leakage out of that projector, which in my experience has never, ever, ever been the case. <laughs> so, yeah, I would rather it be behind me than in front of me. And I will have to just guess what Rob's answer is. All right. Well, I will... Uh, say that these two projectors are both very, very good, but uh, best suited for different scenarios. Uh, so when you look at something like when it talks about its dynamic contrast, now dynamic contrast used to be labeled on off contrast or full on full off contrast and the reason why they can claim such a high number on the samsung lsp 9t for its dynamic contrast for its full on full off contrast is because it is using a later laser light engine where they can turn the lasers completely off on a completely black screen so full on full off it has tremendously high contrast but uh in most scenarios, like if there's just credit scrolling or just a little field of stars in a space movie, you can't turn the lasers completely off at that point. And once the lasers are on to illuminate whatever little speck of light is on the screen, it is all of the pixels are illuminated at that level uh, because you don't have full array local dimming on a DLP chip with a laser lamp. So what we're looking at is the inherent panel contrast how much contrast does the dlp chip itself has how much contrast do the liquid crystal on silicon chips inside of the uh, jvc nx7 have and there the jvc uh liquid crystal on silicon panels have tremendously higher contrast uh, i think it's uh, i think the 4k panel ones are in the order of sixty thousand to one uh, contrast, whereas it's 1500 to one contrast of the DLP chip itself. So when you're talking about a very bright pixel right next to a black pixel at the same time, uh, the inherent contrast on the JVC is tremendously higher. So if you're in a completely light controlled uh, environment, because he says if you, if you can have optimal ambient light conditions for either of these, uh, what does that entail? Well, in the case of the JVC, it is pitch blackness. The better, closer you can get to absolute pitch blackness, that's what you want with the JVC. And in that scenario, pitch blackness, JVC NX7 on a typical white screen versus a Samsung 9T on an ultra short throw screen, the NX7 is going to blow it away. The black levels are going to be way blacker. The uh, inherent contrast on the screen, a bright pixel next to a dark pixel, is going to be much better on the NX7. But as soon as you have even a little bit of ambient light, and that can include just the light that's reflecting off of your light-colored or glossy walls and finds its way back onto the screen, now all of a sudden 
the Samsung 9T can end up looking better. Uh, the more ambient light you have, the better the 9T is going to look compared to the NX7. It doesn't take very much ambient light at all to wash out the image of the NX7. Uh, those black levels being so deep, as soon as you have a little bit of ambient light, well, that's it for your black levels. Now, now you're at the ambient light level. So yeah, it's the two different scenarios. If you're going to have some ambient light in the room, I would go the 9T all the way. With an ultra short throw screen, you're you're going to get the brighter, punchier, uh, better looking image out of the ultra short throw projector. But if you can go full blackness, the JVC NX7. There you go. <laughs> Whatever you said. There was another cup in there, so I filled that one up with water. And now I don't know which one is the new cup and which is the old uh -huh. cup. But one of them tastes. Well, funny. I was gonna say, like you know, the, is the new cup clean? Because that would be a good thing. Well, to check. I don't know. You see, yeah. we don't have a sink in this house, so there's and like there's stuff in all the bathrooms. <laughs> I don't know, Rob. You know, I know, I know one thing. No one person in this house is getting COVID. It's either all of us or none. I see. Okay. It is no every, every we eat, eat off each other's plates. We drink each other's each other's cups. It, I t we ran out of forks, so today right. at dinner we all use the same fork. <laughs> you know they sell. I wish that forks was a lie. A really cheap. I wish price, right? we ran out of disposable mm. forks, Rob. We have lots of spoons and knives, but the forks are all gone. <laughs> and anybody who's ever bought one of those combo packs knows oh, that I'm telling the truth. Those are devilish, those combo packs, because you always end up with like 15 knives and 14 spoons and zero forks. Because all you exactly want is the forks. <laughs> no one uses a spoon. You need like one knife. Animals. You know? I mean, the spoon's only good for ice cream, and most of the time all you do is break it off into the ice cream, and then you're like totally screwed. So, yeah. <laughs> Andrew. Andrew has a 2017 Vizio D Series TV and a Samarant Slip Line uh, NR1504 connected via HDMI ARC, audio return channel. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Samarant Slim Line, of course, is a receiver. He has an over the air antenna plugged into the back of the Vizio for local TV channels. His speaker setup is 3.1, and when he sets the Vizio to output bitstream, his Samarant says Dolby D, and everything seems fine. <laughs> what up? Well, the Dolby D just sounds like a rapper. But as soon as he changes the TV uh, channel on the Vizio, the audio reverts to stereo. If he toggles the Vizio's audio output to PCM and then back to Bitstream, he gets Dolby Digital again. But it does this with every change of the channel. <laughs> HDMI CEC has to be on in order for ARC to work. So is he doing something wrong? Is there a way to fix this annoyance? So when it says Dolby D, is he actually getting sound out of more than two speakers? Uh would be my first question that i don't know i would assume yeah. so i would assume so too but and when it says stereo i have to assume you're only going to get two channels yeah so is that also the case so there you go um yeah that, that would be diagnosing some of what's going on now i mean i can only speculate here that uh here's what i would get you to do um in your Marantz, could you change the speaker configuration to 5.1? Now, I know you don't physically have surround speakers, but just as a test, could you have the speaker configuration as 5.1 instead of 3.1 and then see if this continues to happen, right? Obviously, no sound will be coming out of surround speakers that don't exist, but if uh, it stays in Dolby Digital all the time when you've configured it as 5.1, uh, instead of 3.1, then it must have something to do with somehow sensing that you don't have a 5.1 configuration and it defaulting to stereo even though you have 3.1. Um, if that isn't the case, my honest recommendation here is forget about HDMI arc and just use the optical output uh, because yeah. I have pretty much never had an issue with the optical output doing something I like would, this. And yeah, yeah the, the sound... Do, uh, if you can run the HDMI cable to it, you can run optical yeah. the optical is like the world's thinnest cable it's amazing yeah so that that would be my honest solution there would be an optical cable right uh so he has an xbox one s what should his audio output settings be for a 3.1 setup you should buy two more speakers <laughs> that's what i, think I don't do. think that's, that's completely that's necessary. that's my that's my honest opinion on that one. um no you should be able to basically set it to i mean you can set it to anything uh because you got 3.0 so i mean i if it were me, I would just set it to stereo and then mm. let it matrix out a center channel for you. Because uh, if not, then basically you could set it to bitstream. It'll take in the five or seven or whatever, and it should down mix it to three point. Yep. 
your one. receiver should do the down mixing. Yeah. I would actually, just because if there are any any lossless type of sounds, I mean, you might be using your Xbox One S as an Ultra HD Blu-ray yeah. player or something. Um, I would set the Xbox to 5.1 uncompressed. Uh, because then you're getting lossless audio, no matter what the original source was, you're getting lossless audio out of the Xbox itself. It's sending a 5.1 signal, uncompressed PCM signal to your Marantz, but your Marantz will downmix that to right. 3.1 if that's the speaker configuration that you have. So yeah, I would set the Xbox One S to 5.1 uncompressed. I mean, you know, the problem that you're having with it right now in that you are ha it's not recognizing the Dolby or whatever. Yeah. You know, but that's only from the Vizio TV's own internal right. TV tuner. So right. I don't know if there's something I would, I, there. I mean, yeah, you just need to, for the Xbox, you just mm -hmm. let it do its thing at full resolution and then let the Marantz sort out the decide, channel count. Sort out the channel count. Right. Exactly. Which is the way I would tell you to do it all the time, no matter how, if you had more speakers or less speakers, you know, fewer <laughs> speakers. Uh, you know, you, you would say if the thing is, if the disc is 5.1 uncompressed, but I have a 7 point or, you know, 7.2.4 configuration, what do I do? Mm. Well, you send it to the full bandwidth, everything that it's got, and let the receiver upconvert it or, you know, up, up sample it or not up sample it. Upconvert. Don't listen yeah. to me. <laughs> All right, Jim. So we indicated that we weren't on board with the idea of using styrofoam coolers as cheap backer boxes for speakers. We were mainly concerned about fire safety and not being up to code. But he's seen rigid insulation that's meant to go inside walls that appears to be just styrofoam. So if that's safe in term of a, terms of a fire hazard, could a cooler be okay too? Dude, you need to call somebody in the government. Why are you yeah. at? I don't know. This is not a question for us because I, I, I mean, this is 100% a question for like a building code inspector mm -hmm. and not, not an AV podcast because... I think you shouldn't put styrofoam in your ceiling. And if there's something looks like styrofoam, it doesn't necessarily mean it is styrofoam. And the fact that it is insulation, it just that I'm sure it's not the same because I know styrofoam will super burn. So yeah, well, pretty quickly too. It doesn't take. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you hold does, a lighter to a styrofoam cooler, you you get through that pretty easily. It's, um, styrofoam is like 90, 97, 98 percent air. Right. So what styrofoam is, it's 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 got very little mass to it and if you don't believe me take a cup of or you know like a beaker or something and put a little layer of of uh of uh acetone in there okay. or fingernail polish remover and then take your styrofoam and put it in there <laughs> okay you'll just watch it turn into like this itty bitty puddle little of sludge little speck that's all yeah, that's left it of goes that. away very i used to do that all the time when i worked uh when i did science teaching mm-hmm just do that experiment all yeah the time. It's the, fun. the stuff that's meant to go in the walls there um I don't, I don't know if it's like sprayed with a fire retardant you know coating uh i don't sure. i'm not sure what the exact material is there so yeah i mean the the real answer here is i don't know uh but anything to do with building code fire safety code yeah call your city hall um they're, they're the ones who will actually have the information on on what is necessary in terms of building code and fire safety code. And I mean, that is our only concern. Um, yeah. You know, we're not saying if they say, yeah, it's fine to have that up in your attic as a, as a back box for your speaker, then, then I'm okay with it. Uh, but, but I don't want to tell you to go and use it or that I think it's safe when it might be against fire safety code because that can impact your house insurance. And it's certainly not worth that. It is definitely worth a phone call to city hall to double check. So that's the way to proceed on that one. Mark. Mark is the fellow who asked a couple of weeks ago if he should sell his Oppo 203, even though he has a setup that genuinely genuinely uses some of its unique features, such as its HDR to SDR conversion for his JVC X500 projector and his HDMI input so that his Roku Ultra can also use a Oppo's video processing. We said that unless he is upgrading his projector, they keep things as they are. Although, if he wants to upgrade his Denon receiver in order to gain Atmos and Heos, then a Denon X4500H would be a fine purchase. Well, he wants to do something to improve his theater, and he's got $1,000 to $1,500 burning a hole in his pocket, so he wants to know what you think will improve his theater the most. He's followed advice about several other things in his theater. The room is 15 by 15 with a 4 foot by 5 foot closet in the rear left that houses his gear and has the door removed. There's a pocket door on the left uh, close to the front of the uh, into a bathroom 
that he keeps closed. He sets 10 feet eyes to screen. It's a 120 inch silver ticket screen, uh, silver ticket with DIY masking. He's got a 7.2 speaker setup with three identical SVS Prime bookshelf speakers on wall mounts up front. SVS Prime satellite surrounds mounted flush uh, on the side walls with the tweeters about six feet off the floor and uh, JBL E10 surround back sitting on the low shelf behind his couch basically at ear level. He's got dual SVS SB2000 subs, one in the front left corner, one in the rear right. Uh, he's also got a right, right corner. He's got a calibrated U mic one from Cross Spectrum Labs, go her, uh, <laughs> that he's used uh, with Room EQ Wizard. And he's done Rob's 12 step guide, which he shouldn't have had to do because he just put his clippings <laughs> in the corner, anyways, but whatever. Uh, he also has an i1 Pro Spectro, okay, and an i1 Display Pro color, uh, colorometer that he's used with Calman on his projector. The room is fully carpeted. He's got seven DIY absorption panels, two by four. Uh, feet and two inches thick, plus a doggy bed near the front wall, which obviously is probably the major base absorber in the room. <laughs> he has uh, soundproofed this room to a moderate degree, in his words, good enough that you can watch a movie with the volume at negative 15 without waking his daughter at night. Light control isn't 100% perfect with the blinds in the back wall, but 99% of the time he's watching at night or when it's pitch black in the theater anyway, so who cares? Uh, good looking room. Mm -hmm. Gray walls. Uh, got some some wood accents there. He's got panels up front, panels to the sides, panels in the backs. Uh, his projectors on a shelf that's kind of hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it looks like he's got a mini split unit in here too. It does, I'm yes. Looking at that, so he can maybe tell us all about that. So uh, what the man needs is a couple more pillows. I mean, clearly, <laughs> that's what, the, what that man needs is some more pillows. There is a couch. Yep. It is hard to see from the pile of pillows, but <laughs> there is a couch in there. Somewhere. <laughs> so he says, do we think he should get a dedicated center? Which movie scenes should he use to audition a different center? Or should he just unplug all the other speakers in order to evaluate? Can I say no? I mean, yeah, I don't I don't think you need a new center. That's that's not what's going on here. <laughs> this is so far, like, so far away from the... I don't even know if it would make the list of top ten things I would do to a room. Any room. That even rooms that are not as good as yours. I mean, your room is already really good, mm -hmm. but you have three identical speakers up front, and you want to change one of them? I know people have this notion that you know it's called a center speaker. It looks a bit different than the left and right speakers that are typical. It must be purpose built for the job. No, center speakers were a compromise. Center speakers were not really ever supposed to exist in the original notion right. of having a center speaker. Quadraphonic sound, man. It was Quadraphonic, that's four. That's right. It was going to be three identical speakers across the front, all of them vertical. Uh, but people quickly realized that, well, hey, if you try to put the center speaker where the front and left right go, it's going to be directly in front of your TV screen if you also have a TV. So uh, they're going to put it above the TV or below the TV, at which point it being vertical uh, is pretty awkward in a lot of setups. So people started putting it on the side and then they're like, oh, hey, let's you know make it look symmetrical with a woofer, tweeter, woofer. But that brings in some issues in terms of comb filtering and lobing and things like that. So center speakers are a compromise. You actually have less of a compromise in that you have three identical speakers, all of them vertical. One of them is physically lower than the others so that it isn't directly in front of your screen. But no, I would not suggest to spend your 1000 to $1,500 on a quote unquote dedicated center. Uh, you've got the superior setup right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just to, that would not, I would not. So to actually answer your question, I have no clue. <laughs> to, you know, the, the way that I would test a center channel would be to ah. see how, you know, what to listen to. I would put music on that was, um, that had pans in it. Mm -hmm. And then I would use the Dolby Digital whatever decoder to, to, to put something in the, 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 the Pro the Logic there. or the Dolby Surround up yeah. mixer. Yeah. Yeah. So that it would, you know, you know, you would hear the sound go mm. from one speaker to the center channel to the next speaker to see how well they matched or all of that. Because mm -hmm. ideally what you want is for them all to sound the same. That's right. And since you have the same speaker, I don't understand what's going to be the improvement here if you're not going <laughs> to if you're not going to buy three old new ones. Because I think that if you want to buy a new center, then you got to buy new surrounds. I mean, I mean, left front front left and right mm. speakers. Yeah. Um, uh, in my opinion. I mean, I, I do kind of go by pink noise. Uh, I listen to pink noise. Can I tell that there's a timbral mismatch between left, center, and right in terms of pink noise? Um, 
I mean, I do still to this day end up throwing on Charlie's Angels <laughs> because there's multiple pans in that movie, including the one where the motorcycles go across. Uh, and that one you can tell pretty darn quickly um, if you're getting a tambral mismatch in there. Uh, the Avengers as well, the first Avengers movie. Um, that battle in New York, there's like a full circular pan, which is good for seeing right. how well your timbre match is going into your surrounds and surround backs as well, and front wides if you happen to have them, and are up mixing two such things. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's a couple of scenes that are really easy, some pick noise, and yeah, like Tom says, music that has pans in it. Use an up mixer. Uh, can you tell that it changed timbre when it went through the center? So if he's nitpicking his theater, which is all he can do at this point, since more often than not, it can still wow him, he sometimes wishes for a bit better clarity and separation of sound during loud sustained action scenes so do we think he needs more acoustic panels and or bass traps or could the placement of his speakers be an issue since the rear ports of all his svs speakers are within a couple inches of the walls since they're wall mounted should he put absorption directly behind them or swap them entirely for sealed or front ported models he, you're not doing that for the amount of money that you're spending <laughs> Well, you're he just, he could do the insulation behind them for the amount of money. That's... I mean, not for that center channel. You can't. There ain't no room behind that thing. But, <laughs> There's uh, very, very little behind the center. Yeah. yeah, I, I honestly don't think that you need to do this. I, I mean, if you've got insulation just there, I mean, sure. sure, throw some back there. You know, give yourself something to do for an afternoon. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't know that I would go through the hassle of doing this. Like, I wouldn't buy anything. To do this mm. now, I mean, as many um, panels as he already has, one place where he does not have panels, at least in the photos we're looking at, is directly behind his seats. He's got windows with shades window over there. them. Yeah. He's got a low bookcase that is not above ear level, so it's not really providing diffusion of the sound at ear level. And then a, I mean, he's got a couple of goose pillows, pillows that are shaped like geese. And, I think that's what those are, um, but I'm I'm not sure how reliably we can say they're absorbing anything so i mean uh, a mean, panel... no doggy bed i mean let's be there's no more. doggy bed behind his coach that's that's, <laughs> that's the that's real no issue uh but no i mean honestly a panel on your back wall in the middle of your back wall there if you sit in the middle seat uh when you're saying that you're hoping for just that little bit extra clarity a little bit better separation with the loud scenes that might be a little part of it it doesn't seem like you're opposed to making more panels uh so yeah i mean well, just i'm take one of the ones from up front and stick it back there and see be. how it sounds yeah. if it makes a difference I, i'm the two that are below I'm your screen not opposed to putting a little bit of insulation behind uh your front speakers on their wall mounts i'm not worried at all about your surround speakers so mm -hmm. uh that that isn't a concern whatsoever and uh yeah on that back wall maybe you put in another panel or move one from the front like tom said so if you play some deep sustained bass it will occasionally still sound a bit boomy and the left wall of the pocket door can sometimes rattle any way to improve his bass even further he has zero interest in installing butt kickers or new seating i mean you can't even find the seat you got now it's just a <laughs> pile of pillows so i mean i don't blame you you'd be in there you'd be in there it'd be like minecraft in there trying to dig down trying to find it but um I don't think butt kickers would improve your bass. Uh, I mean, I other than that... maybe turning down the bass overall and just relying on the physical shaking for that yeah. feel of it. I, um, hmm. I, I guess my opinion here is that uh, it's very... I want to know what he thinks boomy sounds like because sustained bass is by kind of definition pretty Can boomy be. i mean that's kind of kind of the whole point point. and he did say uh, like the left wall and that pocket door are physically rattling right. which if right. they're making distortion and noise of their own is right. that what's responsible it could be could be part of it so this is one of the reasons why i am kind of violently opposed to to pocket doors in <laughs> theaters if you if you can get away from because there is really no way to keep them from rattling and there's and there's almost zero way uh, to you know, make them heavy enough right. and secure enough, and then still be able to open them at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would need to motorize it basically, uh, and have it lock into place or or something along those lines. Um, you know, what I would do, I mean, I, and it's not going to help. But what you can try to do is is if you can figure out where it's hitting, and it is hitting someplace that you is not inside the wall, mm -hmm. which is almost certainly, you know, probable. If not, you know, the exact problem there. Uh, 
if because I mean my doors rattle too in here so I put a little bit of that rubber insulation tape you know a little couple of pieces around the frame and Bob's your uncle doesn't rattle anymore mm -hmm. uh, if you can find some spots you know as if it's if it's right where the door is exiting the wall mm -hmm. there and that's where it's rattling you can maybe try to try to buffer that a little bit but you're not going to have a lot of room so you're going to really have to be uh careful that you're not uh you're not uh you know causing the so much friction that you can't get the right. door open and close and that rubber insulation tape i use which is perfectly fine for all the stuff i've done that stuff's a mess yeah. like it just <laughs> it it gets it, it starts to slowly disintegrate over time and uh -huh. you touch it and everything it touches turns black it's not meant for the application i'm using it for yeah so you would want to make sure that you got something even if it was just like felt just gluing mm. a little, couple little pieces of felt mm. down yeah, there that's just on the idea. inside of that frame would probably be a really good idea and um I mean, if you, it would be, this might be even more expensive, but uh, if you bought like that self, the adhesive Velcro strips, okay. and then just took the furry side <laughs> and put that on the inside of that door, that might might help as well. But you need to test it first. Um, those are the sorts of things I would do. And I think that will include, that might cut down on this idea that you're having a, a boominess. I mean, I think it's just, like Rob said, it, it the distraction and the just i mean the quote it's not distortion in the, in the sense that it's distorting the sound it's just overriding what you're hearing because you're hearing the rattle uh there's sound that is, continues is, is, that the signal didn't ask for yeah, yeah exactly uh now there are two other things that that could be responsible for legitimately uh boomy or distorted actual bass like subwoofer bass um two possibilities now one of them there's not much you can do about because he says he has a 15 by 15 foot room he has a square room the same thing <laughs> which even yeah. when you have optimally positioned your subwoofers uh at the midpoints of the front and back wall or the midpoints of the two side walls and i'm not sure how feasible that is i mean he uh, really doesn't have space below his center speaker to put a subwoofer in the middle of the front wall um uh, side walls or walkways I, I don't really see that happening so he's gone for the next best solution which is diagonally opposite corners but it can result in uh, there's not much you can do you have strong base modes in a square right. room there, that, there's no escaping that that's just the physics yeah. of it now we could say the absolute ridiculous thing which is that four subwoofers technically should be a little bit better than two in a square room. I don't know if you want to do that. Also, he doesn't have a rear left corner position. He's That's occupied by other things uh, for putting a oh. subwoofer there. But uh, I'll throw it out there. If he's dying to buy something, there, there's a theoretically a case to be made for having four subwoofers instead of two. But the other thing that I definitely noticed is that uh, he does not appear to have any sort of decoupling or damping. Uh, below at least the subwoofer that we're seeing in the front left corner. Now he's probably thinking, hey, I put it on top of carpet. Shouldn't that be enough? Not necessarily. I don't know what your subfloor is. Even if it's concrete, concrete is not inert. Uh, and that can definitely contribute to both things that we've been talking about. It can contribute to the physical rattling because it's right next to that wall and it's right next to that pocket door. It can contribute to the physical rattling, uh, the physical vibrations, and it can contribute to uh, perceiving the bass as being somewhat boomy or hanging around having some overhang. So I would strongly uh, suggest experimenting with decoupling and damping beneath your subwoofers. Yeah, I mean, you pretty, we've pretty much answered your last question already, but sure. I'll read it anyways. Are there any other improvements he can make to his theater without spending way more money? I, I think the only, you know, so Rob mentioned the decoupling mm -hmm. before we talked about putting a panel in the back mm -hmm. uh, behind you. I think would not necessarily be a bad idea. And if you like that, you might, if you, you know, I don't know how much you love those windows back there, but you might just mm -hmm. take a, a couple of panels, put them, you know, horizontally mm -hmm. on, on top of that bookshelf so that it... Uh, it covers the entire couch sort of thing. Um, yeah. Rob's 100% right with the 15 by 15 foot room. There's just the the way that the, the square rooms take base and just magnify it. it, it and uh, it, it can be something that you can't really overcome mm -hmm. too easily without major, major uh, work as far as, uh, you know, many subs, lots of, lots of 
you know, measurements and EQ and stuff like that. To, Multi-sub to kind of optimizer work. software on top of that too, which yeah. I don't think he would be opposed to given all right. the other extent that he's gone to. So, uh, so I mean, experimenting with that, although to, to use it properly, you need at least three subs, preferably four for the multi-sub optimizer. So again, I mean, if you really are burning a hole in your pocket, maybe that is the way you go. But I would do all the other much less expensive things first, especially decoupling the subs. You can fold up a blanket or comforter just to test it and then maybe buy yourself like the uh, subwoofer isolation feet if you want to spend some money or just make one out of a platform and some some squishy foam that isn't so squishy that it compresses. Uh, the only other thing I would suggest as an improvement you could make to this theater that is completely separate from everything that we've talked about. Um, he didn't mention if he already has like a movie server, like a Plex server set up or a ZPD uh. or something like that. That's something that can take the experience of using your theater and watching your content, uh, you know, to a, to a more pleasant experience where you see all all the beautiful cover art and the metadata and everything for each movie up on your screen and you scroll through it like it's Netflix except it's your own local content and uh, and something like that. So that that would be an, another thing to consider that could improve the experience of your theater uh, that is different from all the other stuff. Yeah, I guess the only other things I can think of, because uh, I mean, the, the, the main way that you would improve a theater like this is just by different speakers or a sure. different projector. I mean, everything else, you've got a lot going for you here. So, But with the level of a... equipment he already has, that's going to be yeah. way more than $1,500 yeah. at this point. Yeah, yeah. So that's like completely out. Yeah. So you could think about adding some sort of uh, absorption or diffusion to the ceiling. Uh, that's about the only thing I see that you can maybe start to play around with. Or one of those you know, panels from Gick that's the both the thing. That's mm -hmm. the absorption and the, the diffusion. You also might want, uh, I guess the only other thing I can think of, is adding some sort of lighting system in here. Oh, he even gives... mentioned he's not super interested in doing that. In his oh, well, it wasn't the thing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, for everybody know. else... You know, it, at this sure. point, it's now time to add like voice control, yeah, or automation, a stuff, yeah. automation stuff where you can have the 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 blinds go down automatically mm -hmm. and the and the lights dim and everything else. And that stuff's not as expensive as you think it is. Not anymore. Uh, not anymore. So those those would be the directions I would go in. The things you, your sound and your picture are already really good. Mm -hmm. We know this. So. Now it's time to do all the little bells and whistles that make it, you know, a real, you know, eye-catching uh, thing. So, there you go. Terry. Terry has the JVC RS540 projector, same as the 790, the X790. And he's starting to think about a lamp replacement. He's noticed that the cool-down cycle after he pro uh, powers off his projector just seems to be a fixed timer, 100 seconds. But it isn't always uh the exact same temperature in this room so do any projectors have more sophisticated cool down that actually senses the lamp's temperature and adjusts accordingly i mean i think they all do that to some extent i mean if, if I it was know. still too hot it would st the fan would stay on wouldn't it i mean i don't actually know i feel like that's <laughs> the case I, I mean i think most of them are just a timer i mean usually they make the timer the, long enough that yeah even in the worst case scenario it will be sufficient and... well so i put it to you i put it to you this way right so uh -huh. the power flicks here and i have my projector on the battery backup but yeah. the power flicks and the projector shuts off and then comes immediately back on because the power mm. the, the battery kicks in right yeah but when it comes back on the, the picture's gone and the, mm. the, the, the projector is off. Mm. But the fan is on, which means that the there is a thermometer in there that says if it's uh, a certain temperature, yeah. the fan, you must turn the fan on. It's not that it shuts, you know, the power goes down and, you mm. know, that now there's no power to it. So it can't turn the fan on. It comes back on. And it's like, oh, well, I'm back on now. There must be a thermometer in oh, there. Yeah, that yeah says, I've had the projectors where like I, I, I have set it to low lamp mode. And right. it's on low fan mode, but then if it gets too hot, it kicks itself into high fan mode. So yeah, right. there must be a yeah. Must there be must be something. Mode. So yeah, right. if your if your projector was too if your lamp was still too hot mm. at the end of the timer, it should kick the fan on again. Right. So <laughs> I guess my answer is I don't think that this is a thing <laughs> that, 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 that right. anybody talks about because I think this is like this is like projectors 101 we don't we can't let our bulbs explode because people will hate <laughs> us so therefore we must put some sort of protection on the fan to make sure that the fan turns on when things hot so 
No. I, I mean, I'm sure the wolf projectors have something like this. I mean, what I don't think there is is something that, like, uses a thermometer to right. keep the cool down cycle to the absolute minimum that it can be. Right. I don't think that exists. I've never come I across something agree like with that. You 100%, they they yeah. always go generous on how long the fan runs after you've pressed power off. Um, right. But yeah, I don't know how. I don't know. Maybe he like turns it off sometimes and goes, oh, wait, I wanted to turn it back on. He has to wait until the cycle is completed. So that annoys him or something like that. But uh, yeah, I think they're generally, I mean, as long as power doesn't go out on you and you don't have a battery backup connected, which you should, um, that you should be pretty safe on the opposite end of, you know, it's still too hot, so it's going to keep cooling. Right. So is there one specific retailer we recommend for getting the replacement lamp? He's looked at Projector, Projector Central's list of recommended lamp retailers, but he's a bit hesitant since he can't quite tell if he'd be getting an OEM lamp from them. Some of them seem to be just selling the bare bulb without the housing, which is less expensive, but he doesn't think he wants to go that route since it would be too easy to inadvertently touch the bulb just a little bit and have it blow up prematurely. Mm -hmm. Well, on the other hand, some of them mentioned that the bulb itself is an OEM part, but they have conspicuously don't mention if the housing is also OEM, so what do we think? Um, I is it Lamp Genie? Is that the place Projector I go to? Projector Lamp Genie is where we used to go all the time, but right. um, haven't Why haven't don't... been going there much lately. I bought my last lamp from them. Okay, and I I now I am also I mean clearly I have not as much worry about my projector as this person mm. does who worries about fans. I mean I just worry about if it's on or it not. is an expensive projector he has. Yes. Uh, so Lamp Genie, at least when I've been there, the bulbs I've seen, they uh, they give you like three options. And it's like, this is the OEM part. <laughs> this yeah. one comes from them. And it's the most expensive. Here is, you know, a couple of other options. One of them is usually theirs, yeah. you know, or the one that they're, they're selling. And uh, some of them are, uh, I've gotten them as raw bulbs. And I agree with you. That is very nerve wracking when you're doing that. <laughs> and I mean, I just grabbed a paper towel. And put and inserted the lamp with the paper towel. It's not a huge deal. You can grab a, grab a uh, you know like a, a a cloth that won't give off any little know, fibers. Fuzz. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and that has not that was not a problem for me. The biggest problem is that my last lamp had it literally exploded, yeah. <laughs> so I had to get the glass out, which was an ah. issue. So, uh, but this last one, I got the whole housing and everything with it. Okay. There wasn't even an option not to get the housing fit perfectly i got their version of it like they had three versions it was the this one is the oem this one is ours and here is this other one that cost half as much as the oem <laughs> yeah <laughs> chinese knockoff um... so good luck you know we'll ship it to you though so i got like sort of the middle of the road one which is sure. surely exactly the way they're pricing these things they're like here you can have the most expensive or you, you can get you know the super cheap one which one are you going to go for the one in the middle thought so so I, that's clearly how they're making their money but it worked on me and their lamp is currently in their in my projector and it's currently doing just fine so for me these days um i i do like projector central's uh recommendations it's nice that they have that uh and i would probably point you to pure land supply uh pure land supply when i've been researching these things has seemed to have a very wide selection including completely oem parts and uh, if you just want to be sure that you're getting the real deal that's going to last uh, I, I just head over to pure land supply i feel very comfortable recommending them cool all right, uh, Andrew, our model spaceship guy. Mm -hmm. we got to come up with a better name for this dude. <laughs> he says, uh, I guess we're going to start with something awesome. Uh, so Andrew heard my request for some high-res photos of the Star Wars posters that his wife painted, so he obliged and sent those over. He did. Thank you very much. Yes, I saw yes. them. I am currently in uh, discussions with myself on how I'm going to frame this to my wife that we need these <laughs> on <laughs> in some way in this home theater because i am i may just spring it on her and just christmas say, surprise christmas surprise and he, then he teased on twitter that there are more where those came from and so he's i guess there's uh, so those were like the three there was boba fett there was stormtrooper and the uh the imperial guard and then uh we got r2d2 and uh darth and uh what's his name kylo kylo, kylo ren yeah 
So they are paintings on canvas. So could he potentially embed them in some fabric that he wraps around DIY absorption panels? He wants a meticulously clean look. So he doesn't just want to put the canvas paintings on top of the fabric. He'd want it completely integrated. But would the canvas be a suitable material? Uh, the canvas could be a suitable material, but almost certainly is not. And then the paint on top of it is not helping matters. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> any any so any holes that would have allowed the air to move through it so the way that you test if your material is suitable to be used in a, as an absorption panel covering is to put your mouth up to it not when your wife's around because you're going to think you're weird and then try to blow through it mm -hmm. and if you can blow through it and feel your breath on the other side first of all it's terrible for a mask you do not yeah. want that for a mm -hmm. mask it does not work but it is very good for an absorption panel so i would bet dollars to donuts that your wife's canvases do not work yeah, so, seems a bit unlikely. Will, the best way to come at this, uh, these are paintings that, you know, your wife made herself. Uh, yeah, they. I guess they are of, of copyrighted material. So I'm not sure if there'd be any any issues there. But these are original pieces of work that that were done by your wife. So um, taking some very high resolution photographs and sending them to a place that prints on fabric is the way I would come at this. That's the way I am going to come at yeah. this when I get these implant when I get the whole back of my room as this. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six panels behind my chair. They're all two by two, two by two feet. So these will not fit perfectly. I will have to crop them in some way. Right. But they are all getting this treatment. Yeah. You uh, got, I'll leave uh... the ones. Up, I'll, I'll leave the ones up front black because yeah. I want them to be black up front. But the ones in the back of this room, this is this is my plan. Yeah, this. there's yeah. a spoon flower and my fabric designs are two places. Get do it now too. Well, I mean, as part of a panel. Oh, so right, right, okay. Yeah. If you if you just want the fabric to wrap on your own DIY panel, then uh, spoon flower or my fabric designs are good places to go. There you go. So when he built his home theater, he ran all of his cables inside the his walls and used wall plates with keystone jacks for a clean look. Thankfully, he did run a conduit for his HDMI cable, but the keystone jack for his HDMI won't pass. Seemed uh, won't seem to pass through signals that use the full 18 gigabits per second. Do we know any of that? Well, he's ended up using an HDMI cable on the outside of his wall, hidden within a cable raceway. Dog, do not pee on my couch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but he'd like to go back to an all-in wall uh, cable if possible. Uh, so this is almost certainly... so. The way these things normally work, and I don't know exactly how he his works, but the way they normally work is you run a full, like a, a just a normal HDMI cable in your wall, mm -hmm. and then there's a jack on the plate that's, that's you know that that you plug the HDMI cable on the back side, and then you plug in a different HDMI cable on the, on the front side. Mm -hmm. So that little connection there is not the full that's not passing through the full bandwidth it's that just he a wants. Coupler. Yeah, so he needs a new coupler is what he yeah. needs. And where can you get it, Rob? So Monoprice has, uh, like, it's not rated HDMI 2.0, 18 gigabits per second or whatever, but it's, it's just a gold-plated coupler that they're like, yeah, this will work for any high-speed connection. It's it's just a just a passive coupler. But that therein might be the issue because I don't know if his in-wall HDMI cable is an active HDMI cable and the passive couplers are not going to work with active HDMI right. cables and that might be your issue because when we're talking in wall we're assuming a fairly long length and uh, if you went for an active one one that that requires power to be drawn from this from the display device then that's not going to work with a coupler and that might have been the issue so as long as it's passive only uh, then the monoprice keystone jack should work just fine but um, yeah if you're using active cables then that might be your issue all right so he's got Paradigm speakers, and during lockdown, he decided to spend some time trying to dial things in as perfectly as possible. He wrote to Par Paradigm, and they said his speakers should be at least one foot away from any wall. So he tried an experiment. He put his front speakers basically right against the wall, aiming straight forward, then pulled them six inches away from the wall and towed them in, and then pulled them a foot from the wall and w also with toe in. Each time, he used the Odyssey Editor app and took a, an eight-position measurement. Looking at the results, as reported in the Odyssey Editor app, he could see some very slight 
differences from one kilohertz on down, but all three speaker placements have very, very similar looking measurements. He thinks he could maybe hear a minor difference when those speakers are right against the wall and aiming straight forward, but it certainly wasn't night and day, and he appreciated the very clean look with speakers positioned that way. He doesn't want to agonize over room EQ wizard measurements, so what do we say? When the Odyssey measurements all look that close to one another, is it okay to go against Paradigm's advice and have the speakers really close to the wall? Is he getting bad reflections from the rear ports that somehow wouldn't show up in the Odyssey, editor, uh, Odyssey app measurements? The thing I would worry about, okay, first of all, what I would worry about when I place speakers near a wall like this is, uh, first of all, is, is sound reinforcement of mm -hmm. specific frequencies. So what you would find is a speaker that would have been flat suddenly has a bloat in some frequencies because you're getting the reflection directly off that wall. So it's the same thing, like, we remember when, you know, subwoofers like you put them in the corner and you get a you get a bass boost right that's right well, everybody knows that we got to put them in the corner get bass boost well you put a speaker in the corner he also gets a bass boost but mm -hmm. we really didn't want that bass boost there because it was a flat speaker to begin with and paradigm are you know fairly flat speakers Very so cool. that would be the thing i would be concerned about the second thing i would be concerned about is having the speaker really close to the wall and pointing straight forward i'm really worried about your front sound stage and how well it like meshes all the way across <laughs> but there again you know, paradigm famously has very wide even dispersion boxes, so yeah. with uh speakers that are more directional this might not have been the case but it's not super surprising in the case of paradigm because they target very very wide very even dispersion from their speakers so if you're looking uh and, and i i think that if this if this podcast had a second tagline it would be trust your ears you know, sure. in a lot of times, because uh, in your case, you have done the test. Mm -hmm. Paradigm told you what to do. You did what Paradigm did, said, and then you also did some other stuff, and you're like, I'm not hearing a huge difference, and I'm not seeing in my measurements a huge difference, and I like the on this, I like it this other way better. Mm -hmm. But it's not the recommended way. What do I do? I was like, you do what you like. Because as long as it's not su hugely detrimental. I would want you to do some of those tests that we talked about earlier about testing the front three speakers. Sure. You know, trying to see, making sure that you don't have any holes in your soundstage up front. Uh, and just remember, too, like the Odyssey editor app. If that's, when he was using the editor app. He was using to, the he was, editor app, yeah. Yeah, so remember what the editor, editor app is really doing is it's it's fixing what it can. Sure. Okay. And if it can't fix the thing, it doesn't try to fix the thing, or at least it shouldn't try to fix that thing. So the fact that you're not seeing huge differences between them only indicates that the problem's regardless of position, are all the same. <laughs> Although, I mean, it does show you a before measurement right. and then a predicted after correction measurement. It doesn't right. show you an actual after measurement because it doesn't take one. Um, but, you know, the before measurements, I think, is what he was looking at. He's not seeing huge okay. differences there. Um, now, it is only showing you frequency response, and it's really only showing you fr the frequency response as it measured it from position number one. That's pretty much all you're seeing in that before measurement. So... In, in that case, you know, if you're, if that's all you're going on, no, you are not getting all the information from looking at the Odyssey editor apps before graph. That's really showing you only a little snippet of the information. So could there be other uh, problems in the time domain, in the frequency response at other seating locations that uh, that would appear visually more problematic than just the before graph? It's possible. You know, if you were to dig into Room EQ Wizard, yeah, you might see something there in the waterfall graph or the... Uh, um, decay graph you know the time to create decay graph or or even in just the frequency response graph at other seating locations but ultimately i completely agree with tom you go back to listening to it with your human ears because very often we will be able to visually see things in some measurement graphs that you just can't hear and if right. you don't care <laughs> that you can't hear it even though you can see it in one of the graphs then uh, it's not a big deal so if you are happy with the audible results after listening to it with the position this way it's totally fine to do that so should he have dynamic EQ on or off? On. For movies, definitely on. Uh, I would At least I would recommend it. Uh, I, I would make the case that for music, I'm not opposed to turning dynamic EQ off because music is not mastered to 
reference volume. Reference volume yeah. is movies. It's a movie standard. Dynamic yeah. EQ works fabulously well with the movie standard. For some music, you can end up with things sounding a bit weird and uneven sometimes because it just it's wasn't so funny because that. you know that that's why it's good that you know you and I are both on this podcast together because I would have just said on and sure. walked away from it because <laughs> my theater never plays music. Like ah, just straight well. music. Like I never sit here and listen to music. If it, if I'm listening to music, it's with a picture mm -hmm. of some sort. Um, yeah. Uh, so what about cinema EQ? On or off for that, Rob? Uh, I, I would always leave that off. That is basically hastening back to the old THX re-EQ. Is that what that... Uh, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. If that's, that's what, what it that is. Was. It's the, it's the okay. non-branded version of the, of yeah, the THX re-EQ, and we don't want that. It's just a high-frequency roll-off that you do not need. Yeah, so the idea behind it was that uh, in movie theaters, uh, they, they, they mix the high end to have uh, uh to be a lot hotter because mm -hmm. it's such a big room and, and so many people the, in it so many people and you're sitting so far away from the speakers right. that they want uh, they want more high end energy so they can actually get to you mm -hmm. so the, the the cinema eq rolls that off but nowadays it's already rolled off in yeah, the, uh, the mix scheme so in mind at one point that they would just take the theatrical mix and bring it home but that right. isn't what we're doing anymore pretty much every release that comes home now has a remastered for the home version where right. they have already right. reduced the high frequency so you don't need the cinema eq so past or present which speakers that we that we've heard or reviewed were the highest value and punched above their weight class in the most in our opinion You think about that for a second. I will say the Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers. Uh, if, if you just want to say what what punched above their price point the most, uh, I would say the Pioneer Andrew Jones. And then uh, next up, I would put pretty much all of Ascend's speaker lineup. I think it uh, they punch above their weight class. That's my opinion. I was literally angry with RBH when they came out with ah, their uh, yes. EMP tech choice. speakers. Yep, very good choice. When they're but they don't EMP exist text, anymore. <laughs> they don't exist anymore, but past or present, he said. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, they came out and they were like 700 bucks for like the towers or yeah. something. I was like, you people have lost your dang minds. <laughs> that is too cheap. You, can, you That's an introductory price. Where you're going to put, you know, that's going to be the price. I'm like, how? How is it going to be the price? And they're like, well, it's just the price. That's just what it is. I was well, it's flabbergasted. I'm like, you guys, yeah. there's just, I, I can't, I won't be able to sell these. And I wasn't trying to sell them, but <laughs> I won't be able to convince people to buy these because I know how good they are. It's a too good to be and true And they're scenario. too cheap. Yeah. <laughs> they're like white van cheap. That's how cheap those speakers <laughs> were to me. And I was angry. So yes, those were, those were the, the, by far the only speakers I ever got angry at because their price point was ridiculously <laughs> low. Good all right, he says. Oh no, it says all right. All right, here, here's a couple of comments, I guess, from him as well. Mm -hmm. It's still yep. him, right? So he ended up doing a factory reset on his den receiver that was playing the Odyssey test tones way louder for some strange reason, and it's all back to normal and sounds perfect again. Yeah, he's yeah. heard a lot of people worrying about second rows of seating. He did that too, but he can tell everyone from experience that none of his friends or family have ever noticed this meticulous <laughs> speaker placement and subwoofer calibration, and nobody besides him has ever been amazed by the uniform base or appreciate the efforts that he went to. So that's why you say people in the second row to you guys no one cares about you <laughs> he says don't worry so much focus on the main listening position if you're happy anybody else who might ever be in your theater will also be happy and even if you know that you didn't put any effort into the experience in their seats and i just want to say <laughs> there's a bunch of chairs in the movie theater that i will straight up not sit in that mm -hmm. there are people sitting in all the time yep like by choice when there are other better seats to sit in and they're like nope <laughs> Back right corner. That's my spot. I will be uh, in agreement <clears throat> with that, Andrew. I I agree with you. <laughs> All right. I am. My voice is getting scratchy for some yeah. reason. We'll have to see. Maybe I got the Rona. I Which hope not. We begin? I hope not either. Because everybody else in here has got it too. <laughs> Luke. Luke wants to add a surround speakers to the 3.1 setup in his bedroom. Good choice, Luke. You should talk to our other 3.1 guy and get him sorted <laughs> out. 
but there's really no way to run speaker wires. Is there a wireless surround speaker kit we could recommend? He has Fluon Signature Series surrounds that he wants to connect to his Denon S740H receiver. This is a bedroom setup, so it doesn't have to mm-hmm. be very far, which means, you know, it used to be like Rocket Fish and some of those other ones that yeah. used to be out there, but the Outlaw is probably the one of the best ones, but it's also probably pretty expensive. And it's, I don't and know you would all... have to add an amplifier to it because it's, right. it's not an amplifier. These are right, just normal right. so passive he's got, speakers. He didn't tell us what, so I imagine, oh, he's, he did, the S740H receiver. Is that, get, is H for Heos? Does it have Heos? Uh, it does have Heos, but it does not have pre-outs and you cannot yeah. use Heos speakers as wireless surrounds with that model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you need something that, first of all, you can turn speaker binding posts into a wireless transmitter because you don't have pre-outs and you need something where the wireless receiving unit uh, has amplification built into it. But thankfully, we have such a thing from Amphony. Amphony is A-M-P-H-O-N-Y. So I used to really like their model 1800 because what the 1800 had was one transmitter device and on the back of that transmitter device, you do have speaker wire inputs as well as a uh, auxiliary in their case 3.5 millimeter but you could convert that to rca so either way if you had pre-outs you could use the 3.5 mill- millimeter input if you just have speaker wire then you can use the speaker wire inputs on the transmitter now the model 1800 used to come with two uh receiver slash amplifier units mono units you'd sit one next to your surround left speaker and one next to your surround right speaker now they're only selling the model 1700 uh the model 1700 comes with a single receiving unit that is stereo uh 40 watts per channel stereo so if you're able to like just put that in the middle of the back wall and run speaker wire to either side that'll work but you can run up to as many as four of the receiving units off of a single transmitter so if you need to have a receiving slash amplifier unit on each side of the room you can get an additional one for sixty dollars uh you won't be using obviously the stereo power of each of them you'll just be using one channel of each of them but it'll it'll function so the package that comes with one transmitter and one receiver that's 99 dollars to get you a start that might be all you need if you can run the speaker wire at the back of your room from the stereo amplifier slash wireless receiving unit uh to get a second wireless receiving unit is 60 dollars more so at most you'll be paying 160 dollars for that solution there you go josh josh has an old yamaha rx v757 receiver it's been a great in terms of sound quality but it doesn't have any hdmi outputs mm. or inputs or anything so the pandemic has made a reduction in Josh's finances, so a full-blown $1,000 Atmos receiver upgrade isn't in the cards right now. But he found a couple of older Integra models being sold off dirt cheap, literally like a like a C-note. 100 yep. bucks. 100 bucks. But one of them is the Integra 30.6 that Tom previewed for Audiohogs back when it came out. According to, to my article, it has a single 18 gigabits per second HDMI input and gained the ability to do 5.1.2 Atmos via firmware update man Josh similar days <laughs> you know, yeah the, the one in that case back then 18 gigabits input now that's we have they, ones with that was one back when onkyo yeah and onkyo was like if we can put it in here we will put yeah. it in here and if we can only put one of them then that's all we'll do but A we'll be the first ahead of one. everybody else that's yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so josh would mainly just like to be able to hear lossless surround v- sound via hdmi so for only 100 bucks do we think this integra 30.6 would be an okay purchase or should he avoid it so it only has one input but it, it only has one input period no it Is has that... it only has one 18 gigabits but then it has i think six others that are 10.2 gigabits oh man i would totally go on this thing that's fine i think that's fine yeah i mean yeah. it doesn't have dts x but, you know, if no. you're talking streaming services, uh, then none of those use DTS. So it's only going to be discs that might have uh, DTS X. It does still have regular DTS. So from Blu-rays that use DTS HD Master Audio, it's good to go there. Uh, it's yeah. only DTS X. So uh, that it's missing. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, 100 bucks. You're not going to find anything else yeah. that, that does that. No. Um, so I, I think that's perfectly reasonable for $100. That's right. Wait a second. This, oh, that was Josh. It was. All right, Jeremy. Jeremy's theater should be uh, should all be coming together in December. This is the fellow in France with the plans that were drawn up by the Klipsch Design Center. Vaguely remember this. <laughs> uh, following several of our back and forth emails and replies on the podcast, you will now have a two screen setup in Epson uh, TW9. 
9400 projector, it's the same as the 5050 UB, with a ta tensioned roll down screen and a 77 inch LG CX OLED. Nice. It's sort of nice. Nice. The sources will be an Apple TV 4K, a Panasonic UB9000, Ultra HD Blu-ray player, a PS5, and his local cable box TV, or cable box. Uh, he has a file stored on a NAS. He believes he will end up using both displays for all of the sources at different times, depending on the time of day and the screen size he feels like using at the time. So he's found himself agonizing over which what his picture settings ought to be. <laughs> He doesn't even have this stuff yet. I was gonna He's say, just man. trying to get prepared. He's like, I'm gonna, He's I'm gonna figure this all out. This, so this I'm is ready a thing to go. that this is a thing that will figure itself out once you install him. <laughs> but let's just go on. Yeah. He's tried to follow several different guys for his picture settings, but he has just ended up confused. Daytime versus nighttime, HDR versus SDR. Some places suggest having different settings for sports versus movies, the different motion settings, uh, and gaming seems to get its own settings too. So can we help him sort it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, what I will tell you from experience uh, is that almost all of us, uh, the, the thought that you're going through, completely reasonable, completely normal, but almost all of us end up with one picture mode uh, for yeah. standard dynamic range. And then when it switches to HDR, we, we let it switch to HDR. <laughs> and uh, with gaming now, because he's talking about, um, what was it, PS5? Is that what he's... Yeah, PS5. Yeah, PS5. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that'll have the auto low latency, which is supported by your OLED, uh, not supported by your Epson, but that's not really going to end up being an issue with what I'm about to suggest. So uh, you, you pretty much end up only having to um, possibly make two sets of changes, um, but but not much more than that. The whole daytime versus nighttime, it's like, yeah, yeah. You do that maybe twice, and then you go, I'm not going to bother pushing the button or even creating yeah. a Harmony macro for it. You know, it's just right. like, it looks fine. So honestly, with the C10 OLED, let's start with that because it's super easy because they've they've gotten it down so well, the settings now, out of the box, that there's, there's virtually nothing you have to do. Uh, you could put it just into filmmaker mode, which frankly is what I would suggest. If you put it into filmmaker mode, and you say to yourself, uh, you know, I'm watching the OLED during the daytime and filmmaker mode looks a bit dim. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable because they set the OLED light setting, which is akin to like an LCD backlight setting. It is it is set very low in the filmmaker mode. It's set so that peak white will hit 100 nits in filmmaker mode as the standard calls for. And that is genuinely kind of dim looking if you have any light at all. So just literally the only change to make in filmmaker mode might be bumping up the OLED light setting. There is nothing else that you need to touch. And when it goes into HDR mode, it's already perfect. <laughs> there's like, there's nothing to do on the C10 OLED. Filmmaker mode, maybe bump up the OLED light setting. Game mode used to not be very accurate. Now it is. And with the PlayStation 5, it'll use auto low latency mode to automatically kick that mode in when you're playing a game. There's like nothing for you to do on the C10 OLED. So I can refer you to Artings, to Ratings, and their settings. Their settings are amazingly short for the C10 OLED because there's nothing to do. The one thing that they do mention is they say, oh, we don't necessarily recommend having dynamic tone mapping turned on uh, over at Ratings. I'm like, that's insane. That, that is one of the features you're buying the LG for. Is their dynamic tone mapping? Definitely turn that on. Uh, so there, I strongly disagree with them. Now, for the 5050UB, there is one major settings thing to be aware of. And this is the one that maybe you've already read about and freaks you out because it freaks a lot of people out. And that is it has a physical color filter that you can, with the selection of a picture mode uh put that physical color filter into the light path and that gets you the full dci p3 wide color for ultra hd blu-rays but being a physical color filter it cuts your light output by about half <laughs> and so when you're talking about hdr because we we get wide color hand in hand with hdr on our ultra hd blu-rays and 4k content it's like you're basically trading hdr because you're cutting your light output in half for the wider color. And I'm not ultimately super in favor of that. Now, over on standard dynamic range content, you should always use the natural picture mode. I know that one's a little bit of a weird name. You might not guess it, but you should use the natural picture mode for standard, dyna uh, standard dynamic range content. And if you then put in an HDR signal, um, 
it will go into an HDR mode within the natural picture mode. You don't get the wide color, but you do get the better brightness. And frankly, I would rather have the better brightness because the color is still pretty good. You're still getting about 89, 90% of DCI-P3 in the natural mode, uh, but you get to keep all the light. So frankly, I would just leave it in natural mode all the time. I would not turn on any uh, interpolation, soap opera effect. I would not turn any of that on. And if you do that, then it's also good for gaming because it's like 26 milliseconds for gaming at that point. So that one, I'm like, yeah, you just leave it in natural picture mode all the time. I will forward you to projector reviews. They have the full set of settings for natural for SDR, um, digital cinema, which puts that color filter I talked about into the light path if you want it, and natural picture mode, but for HDR you basically don't have to change anything <laughs> any of those, but the settings are there if you want them over at projector reviews okay. oh i should say the last thing ub9000 i mean he sprung for the the big boy from panasonic the expensive one um and might have been doing that because he's like hey i'm getting a projector and that one has like two dedicated in its hdr optimizer settings it has two mm -hmm. ones that are dedicated for projectors uh but the thing is you're also connecting it to an oled so i would just basically put the UB9000 in the OLED HDR optimizer mode. The Epson will be tone mapping it a second time uh, when you do that, but it'll do a good job of it. So I would just leave it in the OLED HDR optimizer mode, the UB9000. And I, the reality is, is that what Rob said at the very beginning is pretty much what I was going to say is, is, you know, I said, don't worry about it right now because right. when you get the projector and the TV, you're going to quickly figure out what you prefer for which. And that's what you, that, and then you'll say, I use my TV almost exclusively for gaming and watching TV, you know, right. sports or whatever during the day. And then I only use my projector for movies and streaming stuff at night. So what should my settings be? Mm -hmm. And that's going to end up being what you, what you, what you do. You're not going to have to have, because once you decide which one you like for games, you're not going to be like, well, I prefer the, OLED, but today I'm going to go ahead and go with the. No, you're not. You're not. You're yeah, only going to I mean, do the one you like. There and that's was be a it. time when it was a bit of a bigger compromise to only yeah. use one picture mode, but like these days, like, man, especially with that C10 OLED, it's like, geez, you pick ISF or filmmaker mode, and it's like, you're, you're done. There's like nothing else to do. Maybe you bump up the OLED backlight. <laughs> no, making it easy for us over here. I remember when I we know. used to actually have to know how to calibrate things. <laughs> Alex. Alex needs to upgrade his old non-4K Apple TV streaming box. It's a confusing landscape, and he knows that each streaming box out there seems to do one thing better than all the others, but also does at least one thing worse. Mm -hmm. But he's trying to make the best choice he can, and he'd maybe be willing to get two streaming boxes. Let me tell you something about that. Once you have turned on the streaming box, unless it doesn't have the service on it, right. you are not switching boxes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe Rob would switch boxes so he can get HDR or something like that. <laughs> but most of us are just going to be like, eh, most it's people... YouTube. Who cares? <laughs> That's right. It's all garbage. <laughs> so his top priorities are Netflix, Disney Plus, and Plex. He knows that 2019 NVIDIA Shield Pro can act as a Plex server, but he already has a Plex server running on his PC. So what would be our top recommendation? I mean, the Apple TV 4K is the, I don't, does it do Plex? It does Plex, right? Well, but it, it doesn't certainly do it has, well. yeah, it has a Plex app for it. It does a, a reasonable job of playback, but it will not pass through any lossless audio formats. So yeah. if you have backed up physical Blu-rays or backed up physical Ultra HD Blu-rays, you won't get the lossless audio via an Apple TV 4K. Uh, so for that reason, if you want the one box solution that will do, the three that you mentioned, Netflix, Disney Plus, and Plex really, really well, it would be the NVIDIA Shield. Uh, for Plex, it's, it's the top choice unquestionably. Now, do you need the 2019 NVIDIA Shield Pro, not really. If you already have a Plex server that you're happy with and right. you don't want to port everything over to the Shield Pro, then go ahead and pay less and get the cylindrical uh, 2019 NVIDIA Shield. So it looks like a little tube, little cylinder. Uh, so you'll save some money there. It's still an excellent Plex playback device. It just cannot also be a server, but you've already got a server, so why not save the money? Now, what is the NVIDIA Shield not the top choice for? Well, it does not do automatic frame rate switching for Disney+. Plus. It can do automatic frame rate switching for Plex, because that's built into the Plex software itself. It's not relying on any of the hardware. And 
you have a one button solution for frame rate matching on Netflix on the Nvidia Shield. Uh, it, it has the match frame rate beta where you push one button and it will auto detect the frame rate and match it properly. That works on Netflix. It doesn't work on Disney Plus, but you can still manually set the frame rate to whatever you want in the Shield's menus. So there you go. For those three services, you can pretty much have all you want. The, the Dolby Vision support, the Dolby Atmos support, that's all there. Um, now, the NVIDIA Shield is not the best YouTube box. It does not do HDR from YouTube, but almost nothing does. <laughs> the PlayStation 4 does and the Chromecast does. And those are like your only options for HDR from YouTube. Uh, so I don't know how important YouTube is to you. If it's super important, you might end up getting a Chromecast. What's crazy there is the Chromecast, the new one, the Chromecast with Google TV. We have to say the complete name now so you know what we're talking about. The $50 one that just came out. Um, I mean, that is underlying its Android TV, which is also what the right. Shield uses. So it's kind of weird to get two Android TV <laughs> devices, but there, there's your case. The, Chrome, uh, the Chromecast would strictly be about YouTube. The Shield would be for everything else. If you were going to get a two-streamer solution right now, I would probably get the NVIDIA Shield. That's that's basically a lock because Plex is important to you. NVIDIA Shield. And then the other one, I would probably go for that no, new Roku Ultra because uh, it's $100. Roku has services on it that some of the other streamers don't, like like niche ones that just don't show up on anybody else's platform. And they now do all the Apple stuff. So you don't really need an Apple TV 4K for just the Apple stuff because you can get that on a Roku Ultra now. So uh, And it's less expensive, the Roku Ultra. So that would be my my tandem pick these days. All right. Theo. Theo needs a 4-in-1 out HDMI 2.0 switch. What do we got? Show us what you got. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the Rick and Morty, baby. Show <laughs> us what you got. So my uh, my normal go-to is Sewell, uh, their Switch deck. Uh, they have a 3-in, 1-out, and a 5-in, 1-out. Uh, it's only 35 bucks for the 5-in, 1-out, but it is on back order right now. Can't get it. Can't even order it right now. So uh, over at uh, B&H Photo, they have a 5-in, 1-out for $40.00. I don't consider that to be egregiously more expensive. Uh, it's from a company called Copal that I've never really heard from, but uh, B&H is a very reliable retailer, and uh, pretty much anything that they sell usually works just fine. So there's 5-in-1 Switcher from Copal, the brand, 40 bucks over at B&H. All right. Bertrand from Quebec City. Quebec? 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 Quebec. 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 I only speak French. My son was very <laughs> asked me about that the other day about how that worked. I'm like, mm -hmm. I think it just works. They just sometimes speak French and sometimes don't. I don't know that it, there's. I mean, any working about people it. in France would say that Canadians don't speak French. Yes, that is true. We we speak franglais. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Anytime, any, any opportunity to put another person down should be taken <laughs> by everybody. Uh, we were watching uh, uh, The Mentalist. Me and the kids have been going through The Mentalist recently. And we're in season three, and they were it was a Santa Claus convention, and they were fighting about whether or not to let non-white old dudes be in their Santa Claus club. Because okay. Santa Claus could only be white and oh, Christian. Oh, I see. And I looked at my kids and I said, if you guys think that this is in any way farcical, I am telling you, there's people right now that are super angry that girls play video games. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Right now, yes, they are. are super angry that girls claim to like comic books. So, yeah, any of this stuff. Yes, yeah, so I 100% I believe that there are French people out there who are like, you're not French. <laughs> okay. Bertrand, who probably speaks French or whatever it passes for French over there, says he is finally getting a proper home theater, and he found our podcast and is listening a lot in hopes of getting things right the first time. Good luck. I've been <laughs> doing this a long time, and my theater still isn't perfect. So, oh, good luck. Heavens no. Oh, heavens no. His room is 13 feet wide, 14 and a half long. He wants quality over quantity, and he's used to precise, accurate sound more along the lines of mixing audio uh, and audio studio monitors and... Uh, at the modic head earphones or his frame of reference 
excuse me, and that's the sort of sound he wants, definitely not a bass head. You say that until you get a subwoofer and then suddenly everybody's bass head. <laughs> Weird, strange. There's some soundproofing construction to be done, but that has its own budget and being handled by a contractor. Make sure your contractor knows what he's doing, please. Bertrand has a budget of as much as $35,000 for everything inside the theater, including seating. Does that include carpet and paint? Because nope. that's stuff he was adds like, up. He was like the... the physical structure of the room that's separate but everything inside the room including you know seating acoustic treatments all that type of stuff that's that's within his $35,000 budget that's 35,000 Canadian of course are you looking 84 at 84 pounds pa- pounces what's a pounce feet what is that oh no oh. a pounce inches uh pied is feet oh this is all in french it is in or french whatever whatever passes for france french down there <laughs> over there whatever up there up there from everything's up there for me all right, so he's selling getting a 77-inch uh, LG OLED, and since he wants a cinematic field of view from his main seat, he'll only be seven feet away. He has included the second row uh, in his diagram. Is that feasible, or should he nix that idea? Man, you can always have a second row. I mean, <laughs> there's no reason that you so, could I mean, not, not have quite, a second row. Not quite 15 feet deep. Normally, my answer would be probably not, but yeah. he's not going think... for projector. He's going for OLED that he's sitting only seven feet away from in the front row. Right. So he's got seven and a half feet of space um uh, you know let's call it seven feet because or maybe even six and a half i would 100 percent put that that second row on that back wall the though. second row will smack will dab be. on the back wall yeah. <laughs> the second row will be against your back wall that that's pretty much the case maybe it'll be you know six inches or maybe one foot off the back wall but um you know the diagram he just sketched it up that's not to scale so you probably won't have very much space beyond the second row but you could do it because you are willing to have your front row of seats very close to your uh, flat panel at the front of the room, you, you could do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he specced out uh, an all B&W 700 series 5.1.4 speaker package for himself along with Marantz SR 715, but would we recommend him, uh, but what would we recommend to him for speakers? Now, not given BMWs. that he said... <laughs> not yeah. B&Ws, not based on what you said. Not you based went, on what you said. Yeah. I, I have no problem with people choosing B&W 700 yeah. series. They're, they're very nice speakers, but they are not no, etymotic yeah. ruler flat type of sound at all. It's not what they're aiming for. There's nothing wrong with that. They're going for their own signature B&W sound. I have no beef with that. But when you say, I'm coming from the mixing world, I want something that sounds like m audio monitors and etymotic earphones especially the antibiotics which are like the ruler flat of all ruler flat right. uh, bnw is not where i would go first no. for that for that um, specific he's taste. up in canada so paradigm mm-hmm. wouldn't be a bad uh would suggestion bad. for him psb also would be a right pr- very PSB would be good. very good choice here i'm i'm kind of keen on you checking out psb because uh, definitely available in Canada and pretty reasonable prices too. Uh, it, it'd be less expensive than this BNW package. For We're going to have a PSB really hard set. time spending thirty five thousand dollars in this room because it's so small. Well, <laughs> seating though, you know, he was talking about like the Valencia seating, which is not cheap. Okay, um, well that's fine. I I think that if you in a room this small, you should not. I swear, if he starts asking about tower speakers i'm gonna lose my mind i mean he did spec bnw towers when i looked at the exact models yes (laughs) do not get tower speakers in your itty bitty room take it from experience you do not need them spend that money on a second subwoofer okay first yeah that's gonna be coming up (laughs) uh but paradigm psb there is no reason why the uh, the SVS Ultras SVS Ultra least, is another one for sure. Should not be on your list. Yep. To and RBH if that if you have access to mm, them up there. That is, I will let you know, tough to find in Canada. Yeah. Um, but he's in Quebec. It's a huge city. I, I mean, if he's gonna, if you're gonna find audio. it. They got tons yeah. of audio stuff in Quebec for some reason. Like oftentimes when I'm ordering stuff in Canada, ends up shipping from Quebec. So yeah, um, yeah that that could be the case. But I mean, between those. You're gonna find something that you really, really I like. Mean, he could look at Focals. He could look at. He could. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there. He could look at like the real high end, um, calves too. Like That's those, true. The LS fifties would be. Or or the R series. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be yeah. up there. I mean, yeah, there's multiples there. Um, there's a lot there, and B&W if you, don't make the list. I'll put it to you. Know. <laughs> if you want to boil it down to two that I would check out right away, uh, for me, it would be PSB and SVS Ultra. Uh, yeah. I think those are two that you that you should check out immediately. <laughs> so should he opt for an SVS subwoofer instead of a B&W subwoofer? Yes. C- 
can I say yes <laughs> fast enough or strongly enough? And it should be two of them. <laughs> yes, it should be two. And for the price of the BMW, you could buy two SVSs That's for this one. Right. Yes, and uh, and still save money and yeah. have better performance and all of the things. And now so, look, yeah. not a gigantic room, you know, 13 yep. by 15, basically. You do not have to go nuts. Uh, like even SB2000 Pros would be a little bit of more than Overkill. you need in here. Yeah. You, you, could, you could go PB1000s, although physically PB1000s are even not. bigger. So yeah, I, we, I, in we, this room, I would go with either a cylinder or the SB yeah. 2000 Pros. And the yeah. reason is, is because of the footprint. You That's do right. not have the space for a PV anything in this yeah. room. Um, if <laughs> you really want the port, you don't and need you, it. <laughs> yeah. If you really want the port and you really want the, uh, the, the more output and slightly lower extension, go with the cylinder. Sure. Uh, so a 2000 PC. Pro is what we're saying. Yeah. Go for a 2000 Pro, but probably the yeah. SB 2000 Pros. I think uh, physically that'll be yeah. easier to set up in this room. So do the Atmos speakers need to match in both brand and speaker series? No. And could he save a lot and get cheaper overhead speakers? Yes. And if so, which ones? Uh, just all of them, really. Uh, <laughs> is this going to be a, an install... Yeah, like a insane right. install. Now, I mean, that's... he talked about soundproofing, and I mean, clearly right. in his diagram, he's got circles drawn on the ceiling, so he's clearly that makes thinking. Me think. Yeah, yeah. Install, scenes, yeah. But I'm like, because you care about soundproofing, I'm tempted to say, let's just keep this all SVS and get some prime elevations. Um, yeah. Because I, when it comes to wanting soundproofing, I just I don't like having big old holes in my ceiling, yeah. um, and and I don't know if your installer is gonna put backer boxes on those in ceiling speakers. A lot of them don't, because a lot of them don't come with them. Right. So I'm quite in favor of you mounting your uh, prime elevation speakers as your Atmos speakers. You could you could in a room this size, you could mount them on the walls, or you could mount them on the ceiling. Both will yeah. work perfectly fine. I'm more in favor of that now. If it has to be in ceiling speakers if there's just no choice about it um you, we do have access to mono prices speakers up here i don't know where do we go at that far down in price matching up the mono price you know the he's the, not gonna uh, like it series. i don't think i don't think <laughs> i don't think gonna... he, i think he, i think i don't think he would notice the difference if if he got like a more expensive versus a less expensive one but when you start saying things like they're forty dollars a pair. Right. You know, people are like, it's got to be garbage. That's why I was so angry at the stupid EMP tech speakers because <laughs> it's no one was going to believe that they were good. Now I mean, so PSB, give them the option at least. PSB does have some very good in ceiling speakers. So there again, um, yeah, I, I would. You know what? I'm going to be like, you probably want to go all PSB, including their in ceiling speakers, or go uh, all uh, SVS and have prime elevations as your Atmos. There, that's my recommendation. All right. Uh, is two thousand dollars Canadian a reasonable budget for acoustic panels? I mean, <laughs> I don't, are you going to sit on them? Because <laughs> you have a lot of them in here. <laughs> oh well, no. I mean, it, it adds up quick. Well, it depends on. It, it really depends on. It, you can make these. You can you can make your acoustic panel budget be very very inexpensive if you try. Sure, if you do a lot of DIY and stuff like that. He right. mentioned in his email. He like he's hiring someone to do the room, and that he doesn't want to do a lot of DIY, which Man, totally reasonable. Fine. And you have that's the budget fine. that you don't have to go DIY just to save every penny. So right. So um, it, it, one of the things I'm going to say is, you know, when you are looking at acoustic panels, it's very easy. Uh, I mean, it, to me at least, it's the way that you spend money on acoustic panels uh, is either by buying from a very expensive place. <laughs> or by upgrading things that maybe you do or do not need to upgrade. Acoustically transparent fabric is acoustically transparent fabric. Mm -hmm. There is, it, it doesn't get more better at it than just <laughs> doing it, okay? So when you're looking at the Gulf for the Main stuff and it's like an upgrade, blah, blah, blah. If you're going with black panels, mm. go, it just the cheapest black material they offer is just as good as the most expensive black material they offer it really is no different so if you are going to start spending money on you know if you go to uh, gick or you know one of the other ones and you start looking at uh their panels don't fall down the hole of i need to get the most expensive fabric but i'm only really getting it you know it's going to be dark 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 gray Dude, just get the cheap black one. Okay, <laughs> just get the cheap black one and be fine with it. Right. Um, as far as performance wise, you know, 
it's you it's there is no better performance than than or not significantly better performance than just thickness and air gaps so it doesn't matter if you spent two thousand dollars on the panel or you know twenty dollars on the panel if it's four inches thick and it's four feet by two feet it doesn't matter you know anything none, none of the, the other price is just all aesthetics so sure. if you decide to start really spending money in this category I would highly recommend that the way that you do it is by making sure you're getting the perfect size panel for your 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 placements and that you are spending it on things like I don't want it to be black I want it to be the special color and it's only offered in this and that's important to me and that's how I spend my money so we have acoustic panels Canada uh, which is a, a good place where you don't have to do cross-border shipping. Gick will ship to Canada, but it uh, it adds significantly to right. the price. So all total, like if you want to really go whole hog in here, I could suggest something like three panels on the front wall, three panels on the back wall, two panels on each side wall, maybe a couple panels on the ceiling, and then base traps in all the corners. You total up all of that, and you could be getting closer to about $2,500 Canadian. Um, when you're talking about maybe a few little upgrades here or there. Uh, so I, I would probably budget more in that range, about 2,500 bucks Canadian. Uh, that I don't think with the type of budget that he has in an overall sense that that's like egregiously more expensive. So that's the ballpark I would give you. There you go. Uh, which Ultra HD Blu-ray player should he get? He isn't much of a gamer and he's not against getting a PS5 or an Xbox Series X, would either of those offer the same quality as a standalone player? <laughs> we don't know yet. We don't Dude, know if they're going to be all glitchy in some way. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, as much as I like to rag on Microsoft, um, and I'll be honest, I haven't been too mean to, to PlayStation, because, I mean, obviously I don't have a PlayStation 4, and I'm not getting a PlayStation 5, and uh, the PlayStation 3 is the last one I've, I've really used, and I haven't used it in a long time. But if you remember, I really, really hated the interface of the PlayStation mm -hmm. 3. And it bears to mention that the last time I turned it on, which wasn't that long ago, that interface was the same, and it still yeah. sucks so bad. <laughs> so the, at the very least, Xbox has still been updating their dashboard and making changes to how you interact with stuff. And it's been, for the most part, changes for the better i have enjoyed the xbox for the most part it's 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 interface the best uh or at least better than ps the ps3 the and in both cases you know really the simplest thing to do is to put a blu-ray into something and have it play it back and send out the bit stream right. of it and both of them have been able to do that without a problem i anticipate that all that the ps5 and the xbox series x will have no problems doing that as but like well. we don't know for sure that they're going to support dolby vision off right. of ultra hd blu-rays because the current consoles don't you know there's dolby yeah. vision support on the xbox one uh the s and the x but not for ultra hd blu-rays for physical blu-rays it doesn't do dolby vision so he's getting an lg oled you're gonna have dolby vision i say right. just go ahead and get a panasonic ub820 we actually get quite the price break in canada on the panasonic ub820 um it's it's not very much more expensive in dollar amount than the u.s price but you know after conversion we're getting a price break there so panasonic ub820 uh there'll be nothing to be concerned about for playing your ultra hd blu-rays it's flawless all right uh and i will just note that when i watch blu-rays i do not use my xbox i use my ultra hd mm. blu-ray player yeah i, I mean i just it's not one of those things where it's, oh, well, it's simpler and therefore I, I prefer it. No, it's that it's quieter <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, yeah, there's it, that too. Although the know, new consoles are supposed to be very quiet, but yeah. one never knows. One never knows. And, and it's just it just makes my life a little bit easier to, to do that. Bob in the Philippines. Bob has a 65-inch LG E6 OLED from 2016. It has been flawless. Flawless victory. <laughs> for the past two weeks, every time he turns it on, there's a notice that pops up in the corner saying that it, there is a free replacement program for his TV's power board. The notice is there for about 10 seconds. And we have a picture of it. It says, notice, free replacement program for a TV power board. The current TV model is part of LG's fur... And then dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yes. Okay. What's that speaker he's got? Is that SVS? That's, That's an SVS. 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 It sure looks uh, like one Prime, anyway. Prime bookshelf looks like that. What is the issue? He's concerned that if he proceeds with this power board replacement, that he'll be without his TV for a while. The TV has been working perfectly this whole time. Should he just ignore it? No, you should definitely not. Because this the, 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 power board sounds a lot like if when it goes, 
it's gonna go dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> it's some sort of flaming ball of death. So well, yeah, this would... this has been uh, a reported overheating issue. Uh, so what okay. is the issue? It's an overheating issue. Now, at first, it was only uh, mentioned for South Korean models, uh, TVs that had been sold in South Korea, but they have since started to expand it to other territories uh, throughout Europe and Asia. There's been zero mention of it in North America, uh, and we do use different power standards, right? So there's every chance that the uh, power board uh, section of the North American model is different than what is in some of the European and uh, Asian models so that that's not something to be like oh they're just you know trying to get away with it or something like no that could be a genuinely different part in fact i would expect it to be uh but if you're getting this notice it means you in or you are in one of the areas uh it's not a full-on recall uh because technically it's still voluntary which is like a weird threading of the language. But regardless, I would recommend that you get in contact with your local LG um, service department with, with their tech support and talk this through. Ask them, you know, what the procedure is going to be, how long you'll be without the TV. Uh, but this this is one you should check on because you don't want to risk something with uh, with overheating. That, that can be a danger or just damage your TV. So, yeah. Yeah, I would at least call them. They'll probably yeah. what they'll do is they'll have you like look at the serial number on the back and read that to them and a couple of things just to see if you qualify or whatever. And mm -hmm. yes, you're going to be without your TV. Sorry, Joe. This is the last one, and then we're going to okay. stop because we're we're going to run long. Joe is moving, and he'll have a new larger theater room. I hate you, Joe, and I'm not going <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> we are envious. A new larger. I don't want to move. I want, to, I want my house to be done and want everybody yeah, to get That would out. be nice. He's got a pair of SVS PB2000 Pro subs in his current room, 1,900 cubic feet. They have oodles of headroom, and he doesn't even come close to taxing them. But the new room will be 3,800 cubic feet. It will be fully enclosed. Will this PB2000 Pros be able to handle that? Yes. Yep. No problem. <laughs> Next question. I current, mean, honestly, that's the answer. That yep, is the answer. I mean, this is not a thing we have to explain. It's they're big enough, and your room's small yep. enough. Everybody's happy. In his current place, he runs a 5.2.2 configuration using a Denon X3400H, but in his new place, he'll have enough space that he's hoping to expand to 7.2.4. 5.2.4 is what you meant to say. Let me fix that for you. <laughs> you and in, your surround back hatred. <laughs> In addition to his 3400 uh, H, he also owns the Onkyo TXR Z820, both top out at running seven speakers. Is there some way to use both of them together to run a 7.2.4 configuration? Uh, no. No, <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, no. Let's get the pre-outs. I mean, you could if, it had, if one of them had pre-outs for up to 11, which is what you want. Mm. But uh, no. No. No, between those models, afraid not... Um... So neither of them has the option to process four overhead speakers in any capacity. Uh, the most either of those can do is two overhead speakers. And if you were to say, like, could I tell my X3400H that I have top fronts and then tell my uh, Onkyo that I have top rears and that'll get me, you know, the four overhead speakers? No, that won't work because in the Atmos scheme, the overhead sounds are just the overhead sounds. And if you tell it, these are the two overhead positions that I have, then all of the overhead sounds come out of those two positions. You wouldn't have any front-to-back movement between two separate receivers that can only do two overheads maximum. In addition to that, if you were to say like, uh, oh, my X3400H, I'm going to say that I have 7.2 out of that one and then tell my Onkyo to only do Atmos, uh, well, then all of the sounds that would have been in the overheads uh, will now be playing out of your floor level speakers from the Denon because it doesn't throw sounds away. It just puts them into whatever speakers you actually do have. So there is no way to get proper steering and discrete separation of the sounds with these these two particular AV receivers uh, working in combination uh, to do 7.2.4, you'll have to buy a new AV receiver. There you go. Who we got left? Infinite Gary, Zakir, and Jeremy. Now, Jeremy did write on Twitter, but his is one that I want everybody to hear the answer to. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's on there for next week. And uh, answers no, Jeremy. <laughs> no. And don't is... ever write us again. Oh, don't add the podcast like that. <laughs> that is the opposite of what is true. 
Uh, so yeah, questions that came in questions. Monday Hold and on. Tuesday, they'll be on the list for next week as well. To get your question answered on the podcast, well, Tom scrolls back out to the top. Question at avrant.com. That's our email address. That is the place to send your questions when you want them answered by Tom and me on the podcast. Question That's at right. avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Theo and Alan for going to AV Rant and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and sending us a PayPal donation, as well as our 123 patrons over at Patreon.com. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. For sure. Theo, Alan, thank you very much for those PayPal donations. Uh, thanks so much to our 123 patrons over at Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. It's really appreciated. I uh, really like seeing that financial support. All right. We also want to thank Ken for talking us up to Ascend and DJ for blaming us for his blackout somehow. I don't know how that worked out. And <laughs> APC and SVS for, I guess, whatever. And then we right. also want to... <laughs> Go ahead. I was like, Ken, congrats on the uh, receiving your nine HTM200 SE speakers from Ascend. I am sure you will love them. People are always pleasantly surprised by how good those quote-unquote little HTM200 SEs are. So yeah, that's really nice. And uh, DJ, thank you for uh, tagging APC and SVS over on Twitter there, letting them know. We helped you out. That's right. And again... Uh, we've got some notes of gratitude from Terry, Jeremy, Alongo, Theo, Nathan, and Bertrand. So thank you for your thank yous. Yes, very much so. Terry, Jeremy, Ilongo, Theo, Nathan, and Bertrand. We really do appreciate the notes of gratitude and encouragement. It is uh, it is helpful. It is mentally helpful in these times that we're going through right now. But hey, never been a better time to have a home theater and never been a better time to have a virtual community that you can have a shared interest with. So yeah, That's like right. that very much. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Uh, we, we, we really enjoy it. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Antry. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.